Hello and welcome to episode 30 of the Offline Gamer. I'm Matt. And I'm Ray. And this is our UK Games Expo 2018 review show. Woo! And as well as myself and Ray, we are joined by a third person as we were in our UKG 2017 review. It's Gareth. Hello, Gareth. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back. It's like, it feels like a whole year since I was last year. <laughs> For those who don't know Gareth, he's a colleague of ours who we work with, and he is also obsessed with board games. And you probably heard us mention him a few times because we mentioned about your obsession with miniature games, Gareth. That is completely correct. I'm a little bit obsessed with miniature-based games. That's correct. <laughs> and, and also, just to check whether he's listening, just name-drop him every now and then. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's also true. That's also true. Okay, so we're here to talk about UKG 2018. We are recording this on Tuesday evening, so it's been just over 48 hours since the show ended. Um, and we saw a lot, and we think I think we've got a lot to talk about. And we've also got a few interviews with a few people that we uh, managed to cajole into uh, having a microphone shoved in their face during the event. So uh, we'll get to those as we talk about everyone's games. Um, before we go into the individual games, shall we talk a little bit about the event itself? What? What did we think of it? Was it an improvement on last year? Was it any worse? I don't think it was any worse. I think it was an improvement on last year um, because there was a lot more space. Yeah. Yeah, that helped a lot. Yeah, because last year, um, sometimes just going up and down, like the avenues, I suppose, was a bit of a bun fight, whereas this year... I think there were only one or two moments where I had to sort of like squeeze and sort of collapse in on myself to try and get through a bunch of people. And that was usually caused by um, a, a traffic jam of push chairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there were a couple of push chairs I spotted. A couple of um, those sat trucks as well. Uh, if you yes. people were moving them around, which I thought was pretty hard to move around, but they weren't too bad. And the, the avenues were definitely wider. Having the second hall made an awful lot of difference as well. Um, I think it opened it up a lot more um, because there were more people this year as well. When they were, they were, they were, it was clearly busier on the Friday when I got there. Oh yeah, I think the fact that it was half term as well. You probably got quite a few more people on the Friday who would normally only have been able to come at the weekend, mm, yeah, because um, their kids were off school uh, on the Friday. So why not take them to the NEC? Mm, absolutely, and go and geek out for the day. I don't blame them in the slightest. Yeah. Attendance was up on last year. Um, I I think it was what about fifteen, sixteen thousand last year. It was over twenty this year. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of people yesterday. So yeah, so that extra space was definitely definitely needed. Oh, yeah. I think, I don't know whether it helped or not, but it was also Collector Mania literally next door. So I imagine, I don't know, some people are the sort of people who go to for one show and then go, oh, that looks interesting, and then end up doing two shows at once. Yeah, it does annoy me, though, because, I mean, I'm the type of person who would traditionally go to Collector Mania. I've been to Collector Mania in Milton Keynes a few times, and... Obviously, I go to Comic Con at the NEC, so that's the type of show that I would gladly spend two days in there as well. So it's it's oh yeah for me it's not ideal because you know I mean I'd rather go to UKG. That's fair enough. But if there was someone at Collector Mania I wanted to meet and get a autograph or a picture with, then that would obviously be a bit awkward. But oh yeah, Mads Mickelson was there. Yeah, and oh, I yeah. was I was quite annoyed because that, that's someone I would have liked to meet and get a autograph from. Yeah. Um, and I was very sort of hmm, annoyed. I think it was uh, on Saturday when we were on the way back to the car park, there was a chap in front of us who was saying he nipped out for a cigarette out one of the side doors, yeah. and it happened to be the same place where all the, like, I don't know, stars were that were at Collectomania, and he just had a 15-minute chat over a cigarette with Mads Mikkelsen. I was like, damn you. <laughs> That's the kind of story you always say in the pub, isn't it? And you always yeah. think, it, it never happens to me. Never so is the moral of this story, start smoking and you can meet famous people? As an, as an ex-smoker, I must say, you do meet some interesting people when you're out <laughs> having a fag. You really do, but I never met anyone that famous. Yeah, and then on Sunday, there was a girl behind us in the queue for the bus 
back to the car park who had a picture with Mads Mikkelsen and was waving it around and I was like, I want to punch you. <laughs> Were you sitting there thinking, can I take you and can I take your picture? Yeah, but then I don't want a picture of her and Mads oh, right. Mikkelsen. Ah, yeah. I'd rather just like have a s- autograph or something. Okay, but that's fair I, w- I was tempted to sort of check the prices for Collectomania and maybe see if we could sneak in there at any point, but it was just, there was so much to do at UKG. Yeah. Mm. Um, it wasn't going to happen. Plus you'd also had to pay to see him, I would have thought as well, which would yeah. be cheap. Yeah. No. Never mind. Mm. But I thought UKG was really good this year. I thought, I thought it, it was slightly bigger. Um, there was um, overall, I think, probably... I, I, I had a really good day, but I mean, I'm, my time was quite limited. Obviously, I could only go for the one day officially. Um, but there seemed to be an awful lot there, which is cool. Um, got, yeah, but no, I, I thought it was good. Enjoyed it. Okay. Um, so, consensus is the halls and the size and everything was good. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about the bring and buy. That's always a slightly controversial <laughs> subject because yeah. some people love it, some people hate it. Um, we had a bit of a queue to get in, didn't we? We were queuing for what... Or did it end up being just shy of 30 minutes? I can't remember now, but... Yeah, I think it was maybe 35, because you didn't start the time until we'd already been in it, about yeah. 5, 10 minutes. Let me just open the app on my phone see if it's still there. 30 minutes and 58 seconds I recorded, but we were mm. there for a couple of minutes before I started it, so, yeah. Wow, it's a long time, isn't it? I mean, I, I walked past the bring it by uh, probably three or four times um, throughout the, the sort of the throughout the day on Friday got there quite early to look around and it was it was already easily 150 people deep when I looked at it early on Friday morning yeah. and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when I've, I've been around quite a lot of the stores and I was looking around thought oh, I'll just give it another go uh, one day over still 150 people deep I thought you know what I just don't have the time to waste today um, I didn't even get in there this year which is, which is a shame because I quite like coming to poke around you know yeah, there was a copy of Hero Quest there on the Saturday when we had a look around. It had £75 price tag on it, which, if it was a complete copy, is a bargain, you know, because it goes on eBay for over mm. £100 these days. Mm. But um, that's the problem. I, there was no way for you to check if, if it's complete. You just have to accept that the person who's put it in there is, is genuine, you know, and at that kind of money, you're not going to do that. I mean, I bought one game, which was that um, Russian roulette card game from the guy who wrote... Borderlands, and that was only ten pound, and that is missing a single card. Now it's not going to be an issue, but you know, it's it was sold as complete. So. Mm. I, I mean, I um, you know, speaking about like, here requests. I mean, I I, you, I might have told you before, but I I bought a copy of Space Crusade in there the first yeah. year I went, and it was just basically a box full of spare parts. And um, yeah, it, it was annoying because I mean, thankfully I got the money back. I, 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 they were good about it; they gave me the money back, but. Um, I think it definitely coloured my my impression last year. I didn't buy anything at the Bring and Buy because every time I picked something up and looked at it, I thought I have no way of knowing if this is complete. Yeah, and, 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 you know, and it is annoying to get home to see and realise that you've got bits missing. You're going to have to contact the game publishers. Some of them are really nice about it and they'll give you the bits. Um, some of them just they just ignore you and the game is effectively broken. And you, you know, if you're a nice person, you're a decent person. You're not saying that these people are horrible human beings, but if you <laughs> if you're a moral person, you wouldn't do that to somebody else you're stuck with a game you can't play which is yeah. really it's really it's a real shame because yeah it, i think there's a good there's a good community in the board gaming community people are really friendly and they're very welcoming and um, very accepting and there's some people who just don't seem to get that at all which is quite frustrating yeah what put me off is the same as what put me off every year that we've gone in there um the fact that it's so busy and crammed in yeah. there like, everywhere else had way more space, but the bring and buy was the same size that it always is. And it's absolutely heaving with people. Nobody's moving. Everybody's pushing and leaning over you and, like, pressing against you. And it just, like, just sort of standing there waiting for waiting for the line to shuffle down the big table. And you're sitting there going, why are we not moving? And it just... Uh, it, it brought on the sort of edges of panic attack time yeah. for me. So I did just sort of go, nope, and start just walking around and pushing um, people out of the way and stuff. But it's oh, there's so many things that could be improved about it. So I hope that, like, maybe next, maybe next year it will be in a larger space and the cats come to visit me at, at the microphone. So if you get some weird brushing noises, you'll probably have brushed on it like that. 
I mean, I think the, um, the, the, the there were some positives from what I could see from where the bringing by was situated this year. It wasn't in the main hall anymore. It had its own space. So that was good. It didn't take away from the trade hall and, and uh, the main sort of in, in hall one, which I thought was nice. Um, it did separate that, that queue of people, which you know, obviously took a lot of space last year and the year before. It was in its own area. And I think that was, that was good. Um, you know, fair, fair play to them for doing that. They, um, they obviously listened to complaints and concerns and upsets and they have moved it to a place where it's you know, out of the out of the way. Um, yeah, yeah. But I just, I suppose for me, it's just every time. I, well, another thing I found last year, and apparently it was the same this year, was most games in there weren't priced competitively for a second-hand game. A lot of them were, yeah. you know, two or three quid less than you could buy new from in the shop. And honestly, it's brand new and sealed. Why would you? You know what I mean? For the couple of quid, you wouldn't take the risk. Um, yeah, that was that was because I saw a copy of Carcosa in there, and it was only three quid less than they were selling it from. Uh, the one free elephant stand and I thought for for three quid it's not really worth risking that there's stuff missing mm. and the other thing was so much of the stuff in there was like overpriced for second hand and the, the other thing was there was there was loads of things in there that were sealed brand new games that were being sold out on the sales floor and I'm like well why would I give money to some randomer when I could just go give it to the people who made the game like in like five minutes walk away if that I didn't understand why people were trying to sell second hand brand new games still in the cellophane for games that were there out in the show so let's move on and let's talk about the live entertainment. You didn't go to any shows this year, did you, Gareth? No, I didn't get a chance. I've never been to any of the live shows at UKG, which okay. is I'm, I'm quite upset about it because um, I just never get to, I never seem to get a chance. Um, next year is going to be my year, I think. Okay. Well, we went to two shows on the Friday. Um, we cut down from last year because last year we went to like five shows or something like that. Yeah, it was this, such a rush. It was. It was insane. I've, you know, we'd have a meeting with someone and then we'd have to go, oh, we've got to cut this short because then we've got to sp- sprint over to the uh, the Hilton for a show. So we settled on two We on Friday. Uh, one was Nightmare Live, which was at 12.30 on Friday, I think it was. Yeah. And then uh, Pandemic Live in the evening, which was at 6.30. So let's talk about Nightmare first. Um, obviously, I've dragged you on into this for two years in a row now. <laughs> what did you think of this one compared to last year? Um, I think this 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 one was. Um, I th- well, I think I liked some of the characters a bit more that that came up. Yeah. Um, the the talking wall demon. Oh, yeah. Um, that was in this year's one. I like that. That he he was quite funny. Um, and the dragon they've changed from being a massive dragon just its head to being like a handheld floating dragon um still exceedingly loud dragon dragon <laughs> um i was because now that i've seen it before i sort of know a bit more about it cause well, that's what i was going to say did that help that yeah I, you'd gone to it last year because because last year i'd never seen nightmare live when i was a kid i'm, I'm far too young I was going to say, mm-hmm. um, I, I hate to bring out the age thing here, but obviously you know, me and Matt are similar ages. So I'm, I'm guessing Nightmare wasn't on TV when you were a kid, though. No. It uh, ended in 94, so, yeah. Wow. I mean, I mean, I was probably watching TV at that point, but I have no recollection of Nightmare Live. Uh, I, don't, not... I just don't think it was one of the things that I watched at all. Uh, um, so my first experience of it was last year. But sort of knowing what was going on this year made it a bit more enjoyable. And well, we only had we only had two adventurers, or sorry, warriors, whatever. Um, Dungeoneers is the technical Dungeoneers. Dungeoneers. with with a hat. You with a hat. You had the hat, right? The helmet, the horned yeah. helmet. Yeah, the helmet oh, yeah. of justice. That's the one. Yeah. I think last year nobody won or escaped the dungeon, um, whereas this year somebody did. So I think having like the winning ending was also quite fun. Yeah. Well, when I was thinking that actually somebody on Facebook was talking about this, that he was the person that won. Um, was he the one that got helped out by the guys from Shut Up and Sit Down? Because he, he, one guy won with their help. No, apparently. we didn't get that. I, we had, um, James. Well, it was James Cook and um, a random lady from the audience because the Called other person Sarah. wasn't there. Yeah. Ah, uh, fair play. Sarah, who also got on stage at Pandemic Live later that day. Yeah. Mm. Yes, let's move on to Pandemic Live then. 
Um, we we got there quite early, didn't we? So we were the first in the queue. Surprisingly, though. Yeah. Because we were amazed by that. We weren't like super super early. It was. We got there just after six, I think, and there was yeah. no one there, so we just sat down and made made the queue. And uh, yeah, we just waited for that. Um, James, we saw James pull up outside, and I went and just had a quick word with him. Um, just just to say thank you for some of his comedy stuff that he's put out on the internet because it's made me laugh quite a lot, especially in the last few months where things have been a bit difficult. So, And uh, he seemed to really appreciate that, so that was nice. Jolly good. And cool. then a lady came along the um, row and said, uh, would I have you two be interested in putting your name down to go up on stage? And I went, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> but Ray went. Go on then. So uh, you did, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we went into the show, sat down at the front, in the front row, and then after a couple of turns, um, Roy got asked to go up on stage, didn't she? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, but that went down well. No, it well, was all right. It, well, it happens, doesn't it? Well, I, 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 he asked me, he just goes, is that how you say it? And I was like, no. With, you know, perfect, perfect comedic timing, yeah. obviously. And he's like, well, why did you spell it right then? I'm like, oh, I was 13. Uh, I think I talked too much just to cover up the fact that it was a bit nerve-wracking. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. Especially with everyone shouting things at you. Although you yeah. you probably knew what you were going to do straight before you even got up there, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Um, but the reason I kept asking the audience questions was because I know what they can be like sometimes based on previous years. Yeah. Um, some of them can be dicks. <laughs> some of them just scream at you going get out of the way if you accidentally put your arm in front of the camera or something um which is not very which is not very nice and not very fun and it annoys me when i'm in the audience so i was like i know what you guys can be like so i'm gonna ask for your approval for literally everything <laughs> but i got to cure one of the diseases yes plagosaurus plagosaurus Good work. The first, the first of the diseases to be cured. Yeah, and uh, eventually all four were cured. On and it was on hard difficulty as well, which was even more impressive. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that somebody accidentally, maybe on purpose, forgot to um, adjust the track because on hard mode, doesn't it start at like two or three? Oh, I don't know. I don't, on th- the, don't know if it does. On the outbreak track. I'm sure it has in previous years. We would have won anyway if... Because if, it, it only got up to about five, didn't it? Four or five. Yeah. Although you, you had a brief encounter with the concept of disease as well, didn't oh, you, Oh, yeah, he tried to get me out of my seat. I was not going with that whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going, I wasn't going to put a mask on and start dancing like a lunatic in front of everyone. Yeah, no, it might have been liberating. Liberating, maybe. Is that what they make you do? They make you put a mask on, dance so, in front of people. So, yeah, it's, what happens don't, is we can't spoil it too much. For oh Gareth yeah, we now. don't want we don't want to ruin the concept of disease for you, Gareth. But basically, <laughs> okay. the concept of disease does spread as the show goes on. That's all I'll say. Okay, right, fair enough. You'll have to see it next year. I shall have to go witness, witness this for myself. Clearly, we'll, we'll all go one evening and, and watch it. It's 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 well worth it. It's a good laugh. I think we've we've seen it every year since it started. Yeah. Because we saw the, the very first one as well, didn't we? With, yes, with um, Colin Baker. Yeah. He was just like, I'm the doctor, I'll do what I want. Yes, I'm the doctor, not a medic. <laughs> just go, We're just going to cure this. We're just going to cure all of these over here. Yeah. yeah, actually, that's... And they still lost, so... That's against the... No, I'm just going to cure everything. Ah, Colin Baker, the doctor that really, 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 really hated being the doctor at the end. Um... Yeah. Mm. So uh, I'll put a, a video of Ray's uh, little brief moment of fame on YouTube because um, I've got it saved, and also the ending when we when we won as well. So I'll put that on for for the first time in Pandemic Lives history. I think no, he said. I think he said he'd done it nine times and he'd won once, but I don't know what difficulty level that was on. I don't think it was on hard when they uh, won. So yeah, this this is more important. Yeah, because it's basically. hard, basically. Yeah. Good. I consider that quite an amazing feat considering I've only ever beat Pandemic myself probably twice <laughs> in my entire life. Yeah. Um, so, well done. That was really good. Yeah, considering you're doing it live on stage in front of lots of other people as well, that's, that's really impressive. Yeah. Well done, you. Woohoo! 
And last of all, um, before we start talking about games and things, the food. The food festival was on at the Hilton again. Yes, Chow Street. Yes. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum. What did we have? We had uh, Becky's Barges. We had some of them. Yep. I had I had something from, what was it, the Mighty Swoosh, I think it was. And I didn't realise it came with two massive great big chilies on the plate. Which actually weren't that hot when I tried them, but I didn't eat them all. So. Awesome. And what else did we have? Um... Canoodle. Canoodle. Yeah, that was very nice. Uh, you had Thai green chilli and I had Korean chicken. Mm. See, nice. It sounds it sounds really nice. I went for a pork bun and it was it was okay. It was, <laughs> it was all right. I, I sat there eating it kind of thinking, yeah, I wish I'd gone with something like the bargees. They look much nicer. It's, this was a poor choice. <laughs> I, went with, I went to that again. Yeah, I and then on the s- Saturday... Saturday. We was, had yeah. um, we went to Meat Shack. Yeah, and had a massive burger. Yeah. And they always fall apart, but it's worth yeah. it. Yeah. They're also impossible to get out of the little bowl that they give them to you in. Because the bowl is exactly the width of the burger. Is that in the in the Hilton car park Meat Shack? Yeah. yeah? yeah oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um... And all, well, also by the, by the was it the Friday evening or the Saturday? No, by the, on the Friday evening when we came out of when we, when we came up to um, get some food before pandemic, the uh, the lady masons had descended upon the Hilton <laughs> yeah. again and were taking up all the seats while not eating anything. Oh, nice! Yes, not that there were many seats to start with, but that didn't help. That there are about ten, twelve. Late middle-aged ladies all sat around having a gas, That's a not eating way, anything. Pretty. Yeah. Do they have like special handshakes and uh, they may stuff? Have done. Okay. They may have done. I think. I think notably, they're all very, very white. And when they had their, they had, I think they had a ball or something on Saturday evening. Yeah. They all had like pretty much the same dress, mm-hmm. just in different shades. Mm, of okay. like bluish green and that was about it and I, sus- I expect they'll probably be there next year as well excellent so to just, avoid the Hilton on the Saturday then just okay. Uh, just just bring Chow Street to the lakeside instead of having the like the random street food which is basically just the NEC's vendors outside have actual street food vendors outside that's possibly why they have to do it over there. Though. I wonder if the NEC vendors are, um, are kicking off. You know, they may they may be a bit territorial about it um, and say, mm. "Oh, we know." I suppose I agree with you because it is. Although the, the Hilton is obviously open for the gaming and stuff, it'd be nice it to have it. It's a pain. It is a pain to walk. If, you, if you're not gaming, if you're not you know, walk... going for the open gaming or mm. an event, then it is a. When you're walking around the hall all day, mm. you don't really want to do more walking to go out and get food. Yeah. Okay, I just want to talk about one more thing then. In the week leading up to the event, most people listening to this will know that I put online a map of the expo. So obviously the official map got released last the week before the expo and with the list of all the exhibitors. But they were two separate things. So you had the map with all of the store numbers on and then the list of where everyone was. So I just loaded up Adobe Acrobat and just put the two things together. So edited all the text to show where everything was. I thought, well, this is useful. I've put it on our website, as I have done for the last couple of years. Uh, but this time I posted on Facebook, on the uh, UK board game trading and chat um, thing. And uh, in the end, we had over 2,000 visits to the site and downloads of the map, which was which was amazing. Yeah, it was very, it was very well received. People, people, you, you got a lot of good feedback for that, which I think is a great idea. I used it when I was out and about quite a lot because the, um, yeah, it was it was really good. It was really handy. It was also good to plan ahead as well before we went, so you could see particularly because oh, yeah. Yeah, I was on limited time. As I said, it was nice to be able to go right. I know where I want to go. I know certain stores I definitely want to see. Um, so yeah, yeah, fair play to you. That was, that was really really helpful. And then we got a shout out from some people as well. So actual lol on um, YouTube mentioned it in his video, although he called us incorrectly the analog gamer rather than the offline gamer but he did put a caption on the screen saying sorry about that and uh, we did we did uh, see him on uh, saturday and uh, say hello so that was uh, that was nice and uh, someone else i saw um 
the guys from Shut Up and Sit Down, we went past their store, but they weren't there. So, I mean, they tweeted us to say thank you for the map. So I was going to say hello to them, but unfortunately didn't get a chance to see them. They, they were there at one point on the Friday. Uh, towards the end of the day, I saw Quinn's and Matt there. And oh, I, was like, okay. oh. I was like, we should get to say hello. And my friend was like, no, nah, we're not fanboys. I've oh, never actually okay. um, listened to or seen any of their content, to be completely honest. So. No oh, right, okay. <laughs> I, I I do like the reviews. I do. I think I think some of them, are, most of them, are really really good. And they're very fair. I think. Um, to be honest, I, I like them, and they're really funny. I think they're really funny. Uh, so yeah. And while we were wandering around on the uh, Saturday, we also saw the board game girl who'd flown over from Boston. So we had, we had a brief chat with her as well. So um, yeah, it was nice to meet other members of the uh, the gaming press, as it were. Although we're not, you know, big big players in the space, uh, we're all in this together so you know they're not competition it's just uh, just nice to get get along with pe- people and, and make friends in the uh, in the hobby yep so the event itself we got in a day before everyone else because we turned up on Thursday evening for the press preview which was insanely busy compared to last year there were so many more exhibitors there and we had two hours to just get through as much as we could we, we we had a little list, didn't we? But um, I think we only yeah. got through maybe a third of what we what we were wanting to see. Yeah, I think part of it was it was really difficult to find people because the list that they put out was alphabetical by the publisher, um, name. publisher name or company or whatever. Um, whereas we're looking for the games and then. So if you're if you you're thinking oh I want to look at this game you've got to go and scan through the whole thing out of any sort of order trying to find the game and then also because it's all in alphabetical order when it's in alphabetical order it doesn't put them in table order so all the table numbers weren't in order so trying to find the table numbers for the people that you wanted to see was a pain and then actually seeing the physical numbers because they were just like little letter labels yeah. with Sharpie written on them. And it's like, I I can't see this. And some people had covered them up or they weren't there, so... Yeah, yeah and it, like the the way that it it went, um, like the, how it ascended didn't make complete sense to me. So I was getting really confused. Like one side of, one side of a line would be 92 and the other side would be like 153. And I'm like, how does this make any sense? Yeah. But yeah, also the fact that there were t- over 200 games there. So a similar number of people displaying their games. It was a crazy amount of stuff compared to, I mean, compared to last year. Yeah. It's, it's such a short space of time as well. I mean, 200 games in two hours. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot, isn't it? You, you're not going yeah. you're, you're to be able to sort of realistically look at those properly in that time, are you really? Yeah. No. Okay, so the first people we went to at the press preview were One Free Elephant, because they were the first ones we found, <laughs> basically. Yep. Um, and we had a look at a couple of their games. You were quite interested in Carcosa, and I had a look at Microbrew. So what what did you think of Carcosa? Um, Carcosa is sort of like Lovecraftian Carcassonne. So you are um, a cult leader, trying to summon uh, the king in yellow is basically the the simplest way of describing it um i thought it was quite good uh all of the pieces that came with it uh, look really well made and you get a free elephant meeple uh because it's from the one free elephant people which uh, explained their name choice to me that yeah. you get a free elephant in all of their games yeah, and, I didn't even realise that. Well, because I've got yeah. Awesome, which I bought last year. I didn't even realise there was an elephant in there. That's because you haven't played it yet. Well, that's true. There's quite a few games I bought at the Expo last year that I haven't even touched. Yeah, I mean, I like. I was attracted to Carcos because it's a bit different from all the other Lovecraftian type things in that all the other ones are you're trying to stop the old gods, you're trying to stop the cultists, you're investigating, whatever. Yeah. Whereas this one is, no, you are a cultist, you are trying to summon the king in yellow. And Microbrew is, uh, I mean, we all know why I was attracted to that. It's a game about food and drink, same as most of the other games I buy. 
but and, uh, it, and it fits in your pocket. It does. It's like um, it reminded me a bit of Mintworks because obviously that's quite a small game physically, but it's got quite a bit to it. So yeah, uh, yeah it's a tiny little game that fits in a little uh, a little like case, and uh, yeah, it um, there was it was only like a prototype there, so and we, and we didn't get a chance to go back to the uh, to their proper stall and, and play it over the course of the weekend. But um, yeah, it's like a little um, game where you have to brew different types of beer to satisfy the customers. Yep. Mm, Sounds good. That that sounds good. It's right up my street, I think, that. Even though I don't drink beer. Very very much so. The uh, the form factor and everything else is definitely up your street, mate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Next person we went to see was our friend Bez, and she gave us a lovely hug and said hello, and it was uh, nice to spend a bit of time playing and uh, talking about all the various new games that are coming up for uh, Wibble++. Plus Plus. Uh, we, we played Muckle, yeah. which is Mickle, but because there were three of us playing it at once, it becomes Muckle. So many Mickles make a Muckle, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And Mickle is one of the new games that Buzz has developed for Wibble++ Plus Plus this year, I think. Yes, yeah, so it's um, basically, you if you have more than one Wibble++ plus plus deck you can play it with multiple people otherwise it's it's a solo game yeah um if you're playing with multiple people then everyone has to use the same cards at the same time but basically what you're doing is whenever you draw a card from the deck you put it down and you're trying to and you've got th- three rows that you can use to um put the cards in and you're basically just trying to make words and when you make a word uh, if you get up to, I think it's between one and five, then you take the first two cards away and score the other three. Well, or the other, well whatever's three and, left. It's between three and five. You can't have oh, a yeah, two-letter word. Two letter word, yeah. Because you discard both the letters. Yeah, so you wouldn't get any points for it. Uh, and then if you do more than that, I think you just discard one card, uh, one of the cards, so you get more points if you make longer words. Yeah, so if you get six letters in or above, you only discard one letter. When you score. Yeah. I think so, I had the longest word, maybe, with elastic. Was that the longest one we ended up with? I think so. I think I got I got six-letter word. Uh, I don't think I got anything longer than that. Yeah. I got taftan, which I did have to, pr- did have to prove was a word. Yeah, you have to Google it, yeah. Well, yeah, it's because I was, I was thinking of taft, and I was like, I'm going to check, because I... Th- I I think I, this rings a bell, but I don't know why. And I think it was it was a name of somebody. And I was like, no, you can't use can't use proper names. So I went with taftan, which is a form of bread. So Friday morning, we actually popped and saw Bez again and uh, had a quick chat, which I recorded uh, while you were busy drawing cats, Ray. Yes, for the kitty cataclysm cat wall. <laughs> yeah, it was a sight to behold all those pictures of cats that people had drawn. Yep. Including mine, which was a bit naff, but, you know, I don't draw. It was fine. Some of the others were, you know, less cat-like. You were going to draw a second one, weren't you? And you got told off. Well, I it, I took the card home. It's It was a very poor portrait of my cat. So I still have the card. Oh, yeah, because we didn't get a chance to go back and put it on the wall, did we? No. Oh. I still have the, the card of Numi. I will need to take a picture of it with her yeah. and send it to Bez. Just go, look, this is how bad my drawing is. <laughs> I'm sure she'll say it's a lovely picture. Probably, yeah. So yeah, as I say, we had a chat with Bez and uh, here it is now. So we're here at UKG 2018 with friend of the show, often mentioned but never heard, Bez. Bez, welcome. I am Bez. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for coming by. It's all right, it's no problem. We're glad to see you here. Likewise. So what have you got this uh, weekend? What are you showing everyone? Um, so what I'm basically focusing on is my big thing, Wibble++, Plus Plus, which is going to continue to be a big thing for decades to come. Because the whole point of Wibble++ Plus Plus is that it is a deck of cards with which you can play many games. And I'm continuing to make more and more games with it. Yep. I mean, just in the last week, because I've been a bit manic coming up to <laughs> UK Games Expo, I've invented and designed and developed two entire new games for the deck. And one was a solo game that I've played about um, 30, 40 times now. Um, It's 
I'm actually pretty good at it now. As you can imagine, <laughs> after that many goals. Yeah, yeah. But basically, the whole deck is it's a bunch of letters. It's pairs of letters. And so the solo game that I mentioned, it's like two minutes. You're racing through. your It's called extendable. You're trying to um, make a word and make it grow and grow. Yeah. The other game was connectable, which was a co-op where you're trying to connect multiple different cards, kind of physically. Like, imagine Scrabble, but there's multiple different things to start off with, and you need to somehow get them to all match up. Right. But because there's two letters on the card, it becomes achievable. And then, but with the base game, like the main core games in the deck, you know, you've got just a bunch of massive variety. You've got so much variety. You've got, like, obviously word games, but games to do with language, like storytelling and party yeah. games. You've got, like, the Dexterity one, Grabble, which you mentioned, I think. And you've got now Couple is the sixth core game, which is a cooperative thing. Yeah. You've got Alphabetical, completely abstract. And the seventh one is going to be Puzzle, which I'm super excited about. It's a really good, it's an ab- super abstract one player game, kind of like Patience. But yeah, that's my big thing. And I've got it for sale. It's normally £12, but the first edition, selling it for £10. But like, yeah. I'm going to be working on this for years to come, so like, yeah. whatever you do, like, just check it out. And there's also um, Kitty Cataclysm, which you mentioned yourself. Yep. And Kitty Cataclysm, I didn't have a good quality prototype yet, but I've got a functional prototype which you can totally play if yep. you want and try out. And ho- and I've got the kind of art, some of the art so far. So hopefully people can get a good idea of what's coming out in just a couple of months. Yep. Um, I've got um, Yogi because even though I'm not selling it it's still something that's done really well with my name attached I'm yep. super proud of it and I'm even showing off things further into the future namely my game for 2019 which is just called Plus Yes. and so um, that's a game of frantically shouting things I've also got the game with the longest name ever which is going to be many years into the future because it requires like 550 illustrations which is oh, a lot okay and I've also got Yogi 2, which is a sequel that I was asked to do earlier this year. And I'm super excited to kind of continue working on yeah. silliness. And it's just kind of upping the silliness, making it all team-based. The original was kind of all about contortion and touching, you know, different parts of your body, holding balancing cards and still managing to draw cards. Yeah. And now it's just pushing it to the next level, where sometimes when you draw cards, you might need to um, touch your heads and shoulders or your knees and toes or whatever. But yeah, that's what I'm showing, and I'm super excited. Just uh, before we go, um, we know that recently you uh, partnered up with Alicat Games. Oh, yeah. Uh, how's that been going with you? Yeah, it's been really well. I mean, it's one day a week, kind of generally, I go in, and yeah, it's super exciting. I mean, part of it is just, it's super validating to be doing something that I'm absolutely passionate yeah. about. And some of it's, you know, the boring, you know, admin side of emailing people. You know, I'm getting paid for it, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, some of it's, like, super amazing stuff where we've got a game coming out called Welded Iron, yeah. which I can't say too much about, but it's going to be amazing. It's, like, this amazing artwork of, like, a sort of steampunk... Anyway, I'm not going... It's, <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah. Bas- yeah, it's, like, Victoriana. If you like steampunk, if you like big robots attacking each other... And if you like tower defense, you will love this okay, game. Cool. There's me, David, Turksy, and Cesar. And generally, I think it's a really good relationship. I've enjoyed being there, Excellent. and it's been really wholesome. Cool. Well, best luck for the weekend, and I hope by Sunday night your wall is full of cats. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you are, I mean, this is going to be going out well after UK yeah, yeah. Games Expo. But at this point, this is on the Friday morning, and I've got like two panels full of cats from previous shows, and I'm hoping by the end I can fill up. Fingers crossed, like six entire panels. We will see how it goes. Yeah, best of luck, mate. And the Thank you very much. You. Yeah, likewise. So after we saw Bez, uh, the next people we saw at the press preview were Original Content London, who we knew from uh, a couple. Of, was it a couple of years ago? I think it was because. Um, yeah, I think it was the first year we went as press. Uh, yes, I think you're probably right. And um, they're the guys who did what was Battle of the Bands, but ended up becoming band manager. And they were showing off their new game, which is Throne Storm. Um, this game doesn't actually have a listing on Board Game Geek at the moment, so the only place I could find any information about it was on Amazon. So okay. if you go to their own website and click on the information, it just takes you to the Amazon page. Okay. 
but it's a deep strategy game for two players and it's got lots of lovely cards and a nice sort of um, cloth mat to you, which is a play mat with all the bits marked on, on it and uh, yeah it looks quite good we've got a copy to play and, and uh, see what we think of it but uh, yeah it does look it looks really nice yeah, no, I've not heard of that one that sounds quite intriguing it's, yeah. it, it describes itself as a deep but quick abstract strategy game so there you go mm-hmm. alright uh, then we popped and saw Gil Hover from Formal Ferret Games where he was uh, demoing not only the, the Networks, which is a great game, but uh, also the expansions for it, which were the Networks Executives, which is something I backed on Kickstarter uh, a few months ago, but also uh, the UK expansion for the Networks called Teletime, which is basically more cards for the game. Um, and you know how in the normal networks there were like puns on TV shows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, in yeah. this one, there are puns on lots of British TV shows. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hence the very British, uh, the, the whole Tony Time thing. Tony Time, yeah. Uh, right, okay, yeah, okay. So okay. one of the cards which I found quite good was Blake's 8. I think. No, Drake's 8, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew you'd laugh at that. I knew you'd like that one. That's awesome. Which obviously, it's just the everyone with Blake 7, but um, yeah, I can't remember any of the others now. I have got it, and I did go back and buy it because um, obviously I've got the networks so and really like it. So it's also got new genres as well: chat shows, quiz shows, and kids shows that have um, different uh, effects. So it's not just adding more cards to the game; it adds a few new uh, mechanics to it as well. So, hmm, okay. so yeah, it's um, yeah, I'll have to get that to the table next. It's obviously going to go in the box next time I'll play the networks, so I'll play them all together. So. So that was Formal Ferret, and while we were wandering around, this I don't know if this was on our hit list, but we came across it. It might it have been on, on yours. Yeah. Um, too Many Bones from Chip Theory Games. Ah, uh, yes. Too Many Bones. You like this, don't you? I've um I've not played it, but I, um, I've picked it up a couple of times and thought about getting it. I do like the concept. It, it's a beautiful game. I mean, it's a genuinely beautiful looking game. Yeah. Um, just, it's quite expensive, I've got to be honest. And, uh, £80, I think he said. Yeah, and last year at the expo it was selling for well over a hundred. Every, every time I saw it, it was over a hundred. Um, it's on the list to get at some point and give it a go. Um, I believe it's a dice placement type game, which looks quite interesting. I quite like those. Um, yeah. And um, but I, it, the the artwork in it alone is is really interesting and it's a really distinctive looking game. I like the fact that all the player mats aren't cardboard; they're all made of like neoprene. Mm. So yeah, it's all it's all got this really really nice quality to it. Yeah, I mean. I... One of their other games was on my hit list, but they they didn't have it with them at the press preview, which was Triplock, um, which we did get to see a bit later on in the regular show. But Too Many Bones was also because they were bringing out an expansion this year, um, which is why they uh, well I think I assume it's why they'd come. Yeah. Um, and I was looking at going oh but these the, oh, these player boards are so nice. Mm-hmm. They're not boards, but these player mats are so nice. Oh. No, 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 can't. No, no, no. Too expensive. Too expensive. Okay. Have but you, have de- you f- can't sorry, come. Oh, I was just going to say it's definitely something I would like like to to play. Yeah, it's it's one I'm I'm, I'm going to probably pick it up at some point um, once I've got this year out of the way. To be honest, because <laughs> um, it, it it looks awesome. And um, if, if you if you picked it up like the box, it's well heavy. It looked heavy. It's yeah. really it's quite a hardcore game. Um, yeah, I didn't fancy carrying that around the expo all day as well. But yeah, no, it looks looks good. It looks really good. Next up were two tomatoes, and uh, we had a look at New Corp Order, which I think was another one on your hit list. Yes, so New Corp Order is a follow-on from Peak Oil, which sort of blew up Kickstarter last year, I think, or the year before. Um, and it's about, basically, you're a shady advertising company and you're trying to get shady advert deals. Um, but also, while we were there, I had to look at, at Upstream, which is a game where you are salmon trying to get up the stream to the spawning points. And I liked Upstream. I, I think I came away, I went there to look at New Corp Order, but I came away thinking that Upstream uh, might be more my thing. Um, and, they, well, I mean, all of the games had very nice art and really well put together stuff. Um, 
I just think I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not quite. It's it's too soon to start making games about how evil capitalism and commercialism is, because it's it's still it's just it's happening anyway. I don't really want to pretend that I'm part of it as well. <laughs> yeah. No. Game, games are more about escapism for me. Well, I think it's a, a fairly you know important part of it. And I don't particularly escape very much if I'm just pretending to be another cog in the corporate wheel with um, being some shady ad exec. I mean, it it looks like a really good game. And obviously, Peak Oil, sort of, as I say, was really popular. Um, but yeah, possibly not one for me. Upstream, however, I was very tempted to get later on. Next, while we were wandering around, I just, out of the corner of my eye, saw Museum laid out on a desk, which is a game I backed on Kickstarter a while back, which is the one where you're a curator trying to gather priceless artefacts from around the world to put in your museum. Um, so not much to say about that, but I just got a chance to look at the components and uh, appreciate all of the lovely artwork that's going into that game. So that will hopefully be arriving on my doorstep pretty soon. And yep. just behind them were the Noble Artist, which is uh, Jamie Noble Fryer, who was someone who we wanted to have a quick chat with because I quite like the look of his game Hero Master, the epic game of epic fails, um, which is basically a dungeon crawler, but a parody of a dungeon crawler. And he said that the characters in there are like the kind of characters who... The way he was describing it to me made me think of when I was at school and I was always the last kid picked to be on the football team. <laughs> That's basically the kind of thing we're going. We're get, he was going for, I think, that they're yeah. all like you know pretty poor adventurers that no one in their right mind would generally want to to go out there and start looting treasure. Yeah, I'm just reading the BGG page. It's like as the numbers dwindle in the tavern and heroes sing their way to battle, you realise your hopes rest with the no hopers sat around you. <laughs> It's basically, we're going to go out adventuring with the nosebleed section. Yeah, yeah that's, that's basically <laughs> what it is. So I'm quite looking forward to, to seeing that. I think that's coming to Kickstarter, and uh, yeah, I'll probably end up backing that when that appears, because uh, I quite like the look of it. And I think the last people we saw at the press preview, before we started to get booted out, were someone on your list, uh, again, which was Blue Donut Studios, because they were showing off their game Line, the skateboard game. Yep. Um, we won't talk too much about this now because we'll, we'll mention it again later. But suffice to say that um, I was quite impressed with what I saw. And the yeah. guys at Blue Donut were really, really nice as well. Yeah, very friendly. Yeah. As were the, as were the people at One Free Elephant. They were super friendly. Oh, yeah, they were lovely. In fact, I think, to be honest, everyone was lovely. Yeah. You're all lovely people. Yeah. If you're listening. And then that was our press preview. And we went and got Cheeky Nando's. Yep. And then came back the next day. So um, we've talked for a bit, Gareth. Uh, You were in on Friday, so um, why don't you tell us about some of the games you saw on Friday? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I got to to play a game called um, The Dice Dungeon. Did you see that one? I've heard of it, and isn't it uh, on Kickstarter at the moment? (laughs) It, I believe it is, and I'm very tempted to back it because I had a lot of fun playing that. That was, I was quite. It was a really nice idea. It was kind of think, dice meets connect four meets an RPG dungeon crawl. It sounds really odd, but until you play it, but it makes perfect sense. You kind of dig your hand into a bag, pull dice out, and you have to basically create a line from one side of the, of the board um, to the other side. Um, but you can basically, obviously, it's dice, so there's, there's multiple sides. Um, you can flip, and you can reverse, and you can destroy, and you can you can lay them out. But basically, the idea is you have to get a pathway from one side to the next, and then on. But on your opponent's side of the board like a connect four style board you have to lay like all the horrible traps the dragons the beasties the monsters and all that sort of stuff to try and hinder their progress it was a really cool little game i really enjoyed that one that was good um what else did i see on the on the friday it was so, it was so much stuff i just kind of wandered around in amazement and everything it's kind of um spent quite a lot of time shopping on friday i've got to be honest i, I picked myself up some games i've been looking forward to for a while i sat and finally played adrenaline um which um is i don't know if you've seen or played that one it's uh effectively a first person shooter into a into a board game um with the euro mechanics and it it was great fun I got to meet a nice gentleman called paul grogan who's done lots of um uh, teaching videos on youtube and he he was a thoroughly nice man and he sat and bear, bear, sort of bored sort of bear with us quite a lot and taught us how to play it that was good fun um, yeah he was one of the contestants on pandemic live actually when we were there 
Oh, was he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, he was, he was really friendly. He works for, um, is it Czech Element Games? I think I'm getting it right. And um, they're the ones who make his random. So he finally convinced me to buy it and gave me nice, some lovely promos for it as well, which is really good of him. Um, what else? I wandered around and saw a few things. Um, Solomon came, but I'm not sure. We're gonna, we're, we're, I guess we'll probably go back to that later. Yeah, um, we'll talk about that because we played that on Sunday. We, we did indeed. Uh, I had a look at Villagers Hacks and I was quite upset that I didn't back it on Kickstarter because it looks like a lot of fun. Um, don't know if you know about that one. It's the one where you're the beastie and the villagers are basically attacking your castle and you have to fight them off, which is quite fun. Okay. Um, yeah, so those are some of my highlights from Friday. Cool. We, as I say, went to see Bears and then once we'd done that, we just started wandering up and down the uh, the, the roads or streets, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, in the in the halls. And um, we just had our map and we were just, you know, when we came across something that we had marked off, we stopped and had a look. But there's also a few other things that we looked at that we didn't mark. So we'll uh, we'll go for everything that we, we did. So after Bez, we uh, went to see uh, someone I know, who's Richard, um, who the guy who's designing his game Master of Olympus uh, from his company that he's formed called Bookieball Games. And we did have a chat with Richard. So rather than me prattle on about his game, let's uh, listen to that now. So we're here with Richard Buxton, someone else we've mentioned on the podcast uh, before, someone I've met at uh, Asgard Games in Warsaw, where we play test his, his game, Master of Olympus, which is what you've got here this weekend, Richard. Yeah, so I've bought the current Master of Olympus prototype. Um, it involves um, plenty of the old stuff I've been working with. So the first version of the game used Lego pieces as yeah. one of its components. Um, I still have some of those. But I've also recently had some uh, some custom 3D pieces that stack together a bit like Lego made. Yeah. So um, that's progress. Another piece of progress is I have artwork for the um, all important god cards. Yep. With this prototype, sadly they were printed on my domestic printer at home, so they uh, they didn't look very good here. Yeah. Um, but the key thing is it's a functioning prototype and um, I'm able to demo it, able to build interest. That's the stage I'm at really. I'm, I'm aiming to build interest here. Um, I have some fancy dress with a homemade trident to show off. Um, I have a volunteer helping me out who knows the game quite well. Um, and yeah, we're hoping to get people playing the game which requires them to be Greek gods. They are Greek gods influencing the lives of mortals and trying to prove themselves the best god. That's what we're going with here. Cool. So what's the sort of timeline you're thinking about? I know you're still very early in... Well, not early as in time mm-hmm. because you've been doing this for a long time. Yes. But you're still, I guess, a long way away from thinking about kickstarters and stuff yes. like that but what what long term what how, how long are you thinking so the next stage for this is um like you take about a year it needs to be blind play tested yeah that's the next big hurdle um i last wrote the instruction manual for this a year ago okay. and it was out of date almost immediately <laughs> um so that's that's something i need to do once that's done a year of blind play testing and hopefully reviewing yeah. you know if it can be blind play tested it can also be reviewed i think i'm happy with the quality of it to have that happen now um, after that year, um, I can probably start thinking about putting a Kickstarter page together, yeah. which will again take months and months. Um, I've yet to commission a graphic designer, so if any of your listeners are um, into that, then yeah. um, then do do get in touch. Um, so um, it's possible I'll have launched a Kickstarter in about two years. Unlikely, but we're looking at somewhere between the next two and four years okay. to launch a Kickstarter. Cool. And um, let's talk about the name, Buckyball Games. Where did that come from? Ah, well, um, it's not. It wasn't my original um, name actually, but I thought and thought about what I find interesting about board games. Um, I, I work as a chemistry teacher, um, okay. and uh, I can talk about science for a long time. Yeah. For the same reason, I can talk about board games for a long time. Um, a buckyball is a nanoparticle. Um, I have a kind of demo with me yeah. of a buckyball. It's a nanoparticle um, in which a set of carbon atoms bond themselves together in a way that looks like a football. (laughs) So the reason I find this interesting is the rules that govern what make a football the shape it is with the the mixture of pentagons and hexagons also govern the shape carbon atoms can form. So there's one rule for two completely different things. So the result is that when when you start looking at the universe in this way, the universe is much simpler than it looks. That's what chemistry is for me. Yeah. Um, whereas with board game design, you come up with some simple mechanics and hope the players create a complex scenario. Yes. So in other words, board game design is the exact opposite of chemistry. And that's why if I like the one, I like the other. 
So, so the name is really a tribute to an aspect of chemistry I like, which I think feeds into board game design. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, the quick chat, mate, and Thank we'll uh, definitely catch up with you at some point in yeah. the future. Yeah, look forward to it. Thank you, Matt. So after chatting to Richard, we went to Black Box Adventures because, uh, I mean, I would have just walked past, but you said, Matt, Matt, look, there's a game about food. Food. And I went, ooh. And there was a t- table there ready to demo it with no one playing, so we, we wandered up and had a sit down. So that's Fruity Dimar. Veni Vidi Antipasti. <laughs> which is basically a game about getting a king crab into the middle of a plate of spaghetti. Yes, he needs to get to the top of the spaghetti mountain for reasons. Mm. To I think it's to fight back against the incoming titans, a.k.a. humans. <laughs> Oh, of course. Well, yeah, where, where else would you sit and what, where else would you, be, would you be doing it? Yeah. To defend your, you know, fishy friends from being chowed down upon. I quite enjoyed this. I mean, it wasn't that complex. Once once we got the basic mechanics, it's all about buying new, uh, like, workers. And yeah. each worker has got a specific number of moves and things that they're allowed to do. Yeah, uh, like they can attack within a certain distance, or they can do so much attack, or they can move so many places on the board. So once you've yeah. got that down, then it's um, it's just about working out your strategy and trying to figure out what all the other players are going to do as well. Yeah, it's it's a bit like seafood chess, I suppose. Yeah, in a way, because everything has a different movement and has different ability, with the added benefit of you can attack each other. Yeah. And you snuck into victory. I did. I did because, right at the last second. There. Because I was thinking, oh, it's okay, I'll kill him next turn. And then I didn't realise there wasn't a next turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, next up, we went to ITB to take a look at Newspeak. Newspeak? I don't know how you pronounce uh, that. Is I it Newspeak or I think, Newspeak? I think, I think it's Newspeak, I think. I, um... Yeah. I quite like, I love the idea of this and the theme of it was really cool. Um, I didn't get a chance to play it, although they did offer us a demo. Um, I learned a, another a lesson again this year at UKGE. When people offer you a demo and the tables are empty, you Do say it. yes. Yeah. Um, because you won't get a chance later on a Friday. And I learned that one because, uh, yeah, it, it looked really good. And I liked the idea. Um, the idea of the Big Brother element, that was quite cool. And the code of transmissions between the parties, that was quite cool. Um, yeah, I, I may pick that up at some point, actually. Yeah, see, I remember, well, a couple of months ago, they started sort of announcing it by this sort of encoded game um, that was online, and I was trying to get through all the codes, and I think I got stuck on, like, the last one. But that was quite fun. I thought I thought that was quite a good way to engage with the audience, to sort of announce the new thing that's all going to be about codes, is release a bunch of codes tell a bunch of people if you can get through all five levels of the codes then you win something those were quite fun and then we we did get a demo of newspeak um and we we beat the big brother or the 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 lady who was showing it to us yes so the idea is one one i assume i assume it can be more than one person but they're like the controller and they're trying to see where you dissidents are hiding and meeting up and the rest of you have to sort of if you're the if you're the lead dissident if it's your turn to be the lead dissident you have to sort of encode a message to your friends so that everybody guesses the same location without being so obvious that the controller can guess your location it kind of reminded me of a bit of a, um, I'm thinking of the comparison, it reminded me a bit of a one versus many version of Codenames, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing because Codenames is great fun um, in terms of, but it's slightly different, if that makes any sense, not wishing to yeah. do down. I, 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 I thought you know, the concept of it's a cracker. Um, it could be a lot of fun with, set with, with a group of you around the table. Yeah, I think, because uh, if you do the distance, you get like a little, you pick a card out of, I think there's, I think in total there's eight, code cards variations so we had the same code card and you'd sort of have to 
talk as if you're having a normal conversation but drop certain words in there that meant certain other things which were giving hints to where you wanted the other person to go so we were trying to make up encoded messages all about the games expo yeah um and i think one i think one of my messages ended up being about going to the zoo or something like that um and i think we 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 got it wrong the first time but after that i think we we managed to um we get got back in sync didn't we yeah and it was um quite fun watching the the person giving us the demo trying to figure out what on earth we were doing <laughs> I, I quite liked it I, I don't know if it's a game i would buy but i would certainly play it yeah it's more i think the problem is for me is it requires at least three people mm. yeah which, which is if it requires minimum three people i will normally pass over on the basis that i can't always guarantee a minimum of three people so it just sit around doing nothing so after new speak we went and had a little wander we were actually looking for something else and then uh something may or may not have caught my eye that involved cats so we played a little game called cobra paw which doesn't really have much to do with cats apart from the box art it's sort of like dominoes with symbols and you have to you have two dice you roll the dice then you have to spot the little tile that has the combination of symbol you've rolled get your finger to it first and move it out and that gets you a point so if you win by getting to the tile first then you get to roll again if the other person wins then the rolling of the dice switches and I think we were just playing a two player so I think it was first to seven yeah I think so and it did get it did get quite quite intense yeah because I, like to begin with you're just trying to be the fastest to get because they're all in all the tiles are in the middle and everybody can see them they're in the smack in the middle of the table in front of you and everybody's trying to go ah i got it first haha but then once each of us had sort of a little collection in front of us as well because obviously the dice don't care where the tile is it was difficult to sort of go is it is it in my pile is it in matt's pile is it in the middle and sort of trying to scan through three different piles of of symbols was started making it get a little bit more like ah ah time's running out time's running out buy one in the end yes i'm just, just though. only just only just it was like six six and then and then I snuck in there. But that's obviously the most important part of that story. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on then to Alley Cat Games, someone we know and have mentioned on this show before. Yeah. And we had a look at their new pirate-themed deck builder called Roofless, which is a game that uh, Pete actually mentioned last time he was on the show as one that he had his eye on as well. Yeah, he saw it at Essen. Yeah. 2016 I think that's right I think originally and I think he said back then it was very bare bones but the idea of it was he absolutely loved it actually we 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 were we did want to well I wanted to see Coral Islands at Alley Cat as well yeah. but that was really popular um every time I walked past someone was demoing it so I I just sort of like eyed over some people's shoulder and that looks like it would be quite good as well kind of like 3d sagrada i think is what cesar said or i may be misinterpreting but that's what it looked like to me Mm. so we we sat down and played ruthless instead and it's like pirates pirates poker hands deck building and stuff yeah i i really liked it in fact i I pre-ordered it because i like it so much yep and you got a free promo card signed by Roland, I who did. designed it. Roland uh, McDonald, the uh, the designer. Um, I mean, it it reminded me a little bit of the sort of deck building that I enjoyed from Dale of Merchants. Yeah. Not, I mean, not so much the obviously because in Dale of Merchants you're building market stores in front of you that stay. So once you use a card in the market store, you don't have it for the rest of the game. 
But with this, you're buying crew members and putting those crew members in front of you to try and build the best poker hand you can. Well, out of the ones that are available, like a straight and a flush and things like that. So Yeah. And I liked the round marker, which or the first player marker, which obviously was a little miniature bottle of rum. Yeah, which may or may not have come out of a hotel. Oh, I'm guessing I'm it probably guessing. did. <laughs> so obviously that, that's probably not going to be. In, they're not going to. Um, there probably will be a player token, first player token in the game, but it's not going to have real rum in it. I'd imagine. So I will. De- I will definitely put a vote in to have a, a, a another miniature bottle of rum in the game. That that will definitely help us sell. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at it next. I I, I just um. I saw this being played as I wandered around. It did look really good. Um, the artwork is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, it looks like. It. And I, I do like my deck builders. I, although I am, I am, I am definitely a miniature gamer. My other love is deck builders. Um, and hmm, I, I actually wish I played this one. It looks really nice. Well, you'll be able to once it arrives at Matt's house. There you go. Then you see, absolutely you brilliant. Yeah, yeah. More reasons to have a gaming night <laughs> after work. So that was our Friday. Um, our Saturday started off um, with a visit to the Harbour Stand. Yes, for uh, two two reasons. Yes. One was for me to say hello to someone who messaged me on Facebook to say, thanks for the map, Matt. And I was like, yeah, hello, no problem. Because he said they were actually telling people at the show to go to our website to look at it because people were getting lost. So that's quite nice. Yeah. And then the other reason was because I wanted to have a, a quick look at Quazu. Yeah. Which um, I think was up for... I think it was up for an award. It may have been one of the children's awards. But it did look really fun. It's sort of... um, You have... It's really difficult to describe. There's like a raised part of the board in the middle, behind which is the wall behind the waterfall that the... I can't remember what the name... I can't remember if the name of the people was the Aquazu. But basically these tribe of people their most precious commodity is gemstones so they hide them in cracks in the wall behind a waterfall and on the board is a representation of that wall and the waterfall so as you go along you have to try and um, lay down colour appropriate cards to place one of your gemstones in the wall in the most opportune place to score you points and then as the ra- the rounds go on, um, the waterfall slowly moves across and the gap that you can see of the wall where you can place your gemstones moves across. Um, and uh, I believe it's it, the higher the points are, the further it, it sort of goes along. Um, and it looked quite fun. We didn't get to have a play. No. I think they were probably saving it for you know actual children. <laughs> but it looked perfectly fine for adults as well to be honest yeah it looked very fun and nice and colorful mm, yeah, i'm looking at I'm, I'm looking i'm sorry, looking at the pictures it looks nice uh we then went along to uh, i think it was one of the secondary asthma day stands yeah um to have a look at something i think you had this on your list didn't you when i dream yeah this was sort of on my maybe if if we happen to come across it at the right time lists um, cause originally I wanted to go to the asthma D stand to look at some other stuff, yeah. um, which we didn't find at all for some reason. Um, but when I dream was there and it was completely empty and the chap for some reason wearing a sombrero, um, yeah. was very happy to have someone to come and, um, show the game. So it's a party game. So there are a bunch of other people who played it with us. And in said party game, you are trying... Well, one of you is wearing a blindfold, like the little cat mask you use if you if it's really bright outside and you want to go to sleep. There's a big deck of cards inside a bed-shaped holder. Everybody else is trying to say one word to get the person with the blindfold to guess the word that's on the card. The twisty-turny bit is that everybody has like a a hidden identity. So you're either a fairy, a boogeyman, or the sandman. The fairy... Fairies will win if the blindfolded person 
guesses more correct answers than wrong answers. Mm -hmm. The boogeyman will win if there are more wrong answers than right answers. And the sandman wins if both stacks are equal. So if you guess equally number of wrong and correct uh, words. So the first round, I was the sandman, which was ridiculously difficult. I'm like, there's no way I can get this these two stacks to be equal this is crazy this this woman is a genius how does she keep guessing these words and then the second round i had the blindfold on and matt was the boogeyman mm -hmm. which was ironic because i was mostly using you to verify what my guesses were based oh, really? on the other two people okay that's interesting yeah. but it was because the one of the girls was so quiet i could barely hear what she was saying like like one of one of the words she said, I just completely had no idea. It, it was so quiet. So I was like, okay, let's see what Matt says. But I was pretty much just wait, waiting for you to say something to verify what my own idea right, was, okay. which was, I'm not sure whether that means I, I have particularly good lateral thinking if you were the person who's trying to make me fail. Obviously, it's because I, I think too sidewaysy. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. So after When I Dream, we were specifically going to try and find actual lol to say hi and thanks and you got our name wrong. Um, yeah. But he was he also happened to be volunteering at the Fog of Love stand, which happened to vacate two seats for a demo just as we arrived. Mm. So that's he lucky. said, "I was lucky." Yeah. It, it was absolutely round whenever I walked past it. Oh, it was. It was. It was very it's rammed yeah like we we sat down and then two more people sat down and then two more people sat down it was just a never-ending stream of like two people two people get up two people sit down mm. um but actual lol said why don't you try the game and i said well i've heard of it so you know why not i've heard it's quite good uh so we sat down for a game of fog of love which if you haven't heard of it or heard about it you are playing a romantic relationship. So one of you is each partner and you're trying to get... I think the idea is you get the most sort of satisfaction as possible and see whether the relationship lasts. Um, so if by the end you break up, you kind of lose the game. Apparently, I've, I've heard somewhere that you should, it's a game you should not play with your partner. Uh, apparently, <laughs> well, there were there was a I think there were two couples to our well to my right to to Matt's left. There were two couples there, and the one immediately next to us did ask and say, "Should we play this as a couple?" And um, actual old did say. Well, I play it with my girlfriend all oh, the yeah, time. Did, yeah. It's fine. I think I don't. I I don't necessarily see why it would be a problem, unless you are specifically, you've you've somehow managed to pick traits and features that are the real you. Yeah. Because the idea is you you pick like traits and features and occupation to make a person. All right. So I I was like a. a Jealous, shy, caring, royal heiress. I can't remember. I was very tanned. That was it. I can't remember the other features that I had. I'm like, that's nothing like the real me at all. Yeah, and my character was an internet celebrity, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're trying to match the symbols that are on your cards only you can see to what's on the board which you do by playing through scenarios so unless you have a very very sort of spooky coincidental relationship that exactly mirrors the fog of love relationship you have created ad hoc i don't, I don't see why it would be that much of a problem between real real partners oh, okay fair enough it was it was it was a fun game, even though we we played like a sort of squashed down version with some of the later game mechanics weren't in there because we only did like the first scenario kind of thing. Yeah, but I could also see it taking quite a while. 
Hmm. If uh, depending on how many scenarios you have to play through. Yeah, not for me, but I could appreciate why people like it. Yeah, I think I think I can see why it did it did so well. Yeah, and it's come out. It's had quite a lot of critical applause, as it were. I think it's a game that uh, um, I, I I like the artwork, and it's I know the the mechanics are meant to be really really good in it. it. Doesn't really appeal to me, to be honest. But I I can see again, same as you guys, I can see why it's done well, why people like it. Yeah. It's not particularly on my list, but at the same point, I, I would I would get a game of it at some point if somebody I knew actually picks it up. Yeah, it's something that I would play, but I don't think it would be more than maybe once or twice. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wouldn't be a permanent fixture. No, no. I think, I think I think repeatedly playing it too much to the sort of detriment of anything else is would get kind of boring, but. but- Plus, also, you, you know, you know what else is missing from it, don't you? It's it's not got enough miniatures, <laughs> or or cats, or food. Exactly. There you go. You could add miniatures. I um, I could proxy some in, I suppose. I've got I've got a few thousand in my games room. Yeah, just bring out some orcs. That'll make it so, infinitely uh, better. You could do like a, a space hawk versus like the orcs, or space hawk versus the uh, gene sealers. Uh, fog, yeah. fog of love. That could be interesting. That'd be an interesting crossover. Yeah. So then after that, we were wandering, and I happened to wander past Osprey Games, who were showing Sakura, just as two people were about to start a demo. So I leant over and I was like, can I play? <laughs> and then Matt got Matt got dragged into it as well. I'm glad but, I did. I, I yeah. actually really like this. I, I really do. It's a, it's a Rainer Knizia game, and a lot of his games I, I like. Yeah, so... The, the basic premise is you are, I don't know, courtiers in the emperor's court in Japan and he's walking through the garden um, and you're trying to get, I think it was get the best pictures of him with uh, against the cherry trees and you have to, you all play a card at once, face down, then flip it over and then you play them in ascending order based on the little number that's in the bottom corner. You have to move the emperor and yourself in such a way that you don't end up bumping into the emperor, otherwise you get sent three spaces back. As opposed to getting your head cut off. Or... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you do lose a favour. Yeah, you uh... lose a favour if you bump into him. Right, okay. And then there are, there's three three picture points or scenic points and if you happen to be the closest to him when he lands on that space you get the top points and the the second person gets the second points what and so on and i I won that as well but only just because i tied with one of the other chaps that was there um and the tiebreaker was if you happen to be the person closest to him right now then you win so I found it quite fun. I did. I like the I... fact that you're not sure what the other players are going to do. So oh, yeah. you can only plan your move to a certain extent. Yeah. And I, I think looking at looking at the board, it looked quite small. And I was thinking, this isn't going to take that long, surely. This is this looks quite simple. But then when you start playing it, there's way more to it yeah. than first meets the eye. And I quite like that as well. Yeah, I think we were playing it for a good twenty twenty five minutes, weren't we? Yeah, and the art was really nice as well. Yeah, mm. it's a really really pretty looking game that one. To be fair, it mm. is. Yeah. So eventually, we wound up in the second hall at about halfway through Saturday. So it took us yep. one and a half days to do hall one. And the first game we saw there, my eyes lit up because we found a party game about making terrible puns. Oh my god! It's like it was written yeah. for you, Matt. <laughs> I know. And 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 Matt and the lady at the stand then decided to start having a pun off. Uh, <laughs> we, did, we started punning with each other. So this was uh, rampunctious, and uh, as I say, it's just uh, the game starts. I'll read it from the BGG page. The game starts by the players making puns out of their own names. Whoever has the best pun becomes the pundit. Oh. Pundit has a hand of five <laughs> cards. They draw a scenario from the deck and read it aloud to start the round. 
Each scenario shows a unique, fictitious situation. The pundit then plays a topic of their choice from their hand, and the players must make as many puns as possible by combining the scenario and the topic. So there you go. Hmm. It's uh, it was good. I like the look of it. I'm sort of annoyed with myself that I didn't go back and buy a copy actually because it was twenty pound. I should have bought this. But never mind. I might keep my eyes open for it again in the future. I've got quite a few party games now. I didn't really want to buy too many more, but um, it's puns in it. Yeah. So next we went and saw Quality Beast because I wanted to check out how Seize the Bean was doing. They had a, a copy on display, and uh, it's looking very nice. I like the little coffee beans that they, they had there. It was uh, really, really looking good. Can't wait yeah. for that to ship uh, at some point. I, yeah, I, pl- I played that one last year. I really liked this bean. I thought, I thought it, was, it was a good game. Yeah. Um, good fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a play of their new game, which was Towers of the Sun, um, which is an abstract strategy game, which is the next one they're going to be releasing, uh, which is all about building towers. And there's, there's basically like a, on the board... And you've got certain spaces you can build the towers and you have your little meeple that can move between them. Um, but you can only move between towers that are the same height. If you want to move up or down a level uh, to a tower that's taller or shorter, you have to pay a penalty and leave a gem behind. And everyone's got a certain amount of gems and a certain amount of tower tiles that they can use. And also you get points for, at the end of the game, if you've got any gems and tower tiles uh, left that match up so if you've got three gems and three tower tiles you get like however many points but you'd lose points if you had gems that didn't have a corresponding tile to sit on so um, difficult to explain as I say it's abstract strategy game but uh, I really liked it um, I started off really well and then started to fade as the, the game went on but you and the, the chap from Quality Beast who was demoing it to us you were you started to get stronger and you ended up both having quite a lot more points than me at the end of the game. And the other game that they were demoing, which we didn't get a chance to play, but we had a look at, was Quantified, which is a uh, game all about uh, social inequality and refugees and things like that, which uh, looked quite interesting, but we didn't really get a chance to play it. Um, Looking on the BGD page, it describes it as a co-op board game in a world where everyone's behaviour is constantly surveilled and analysed, which is quite interesting. And your behaviour results in you getting a social credit score. Um, I won't talk too much about this because we had a chance to chat to the designer of the game, uh, Yana, who was there. And uh, so let's have a listen to our brief chat with her now. Okay, so we're here with Yana from Quality Beast. Hi Yana, thanks for joining us. Um, Why don't you tell us what you're showing here at uh, UK Games Expo this year? Hi, thanks for stopping by. That's right. Um, what you see here is a cooperative game on human rights, yeah. uh, which will be published by Quality Beast yeah. on Kickstarter. Um, and the special um, thing about this game is that you start from different positions in society. So right. it's an asymmetric starting condition for every player. Yeah. Some uh, players start as a refugee, another as a migrant, an unemployed or an employed person. Yeah. And that defines your position on the social ladder. And depending on how high or how low you stand, you have access to certain rights. So you have access to certain abilities in the game. So the higher position player can do pretty almost everything, and the refugee on the bottom of the ladder is pretty restricted in what they can do. And the goal of the game is that all of the players have all of the human rights at the end of the game. So you're trying to climb the ladder, but at the same time, government and corporations, they raise the bars. So you're tearing, trying to tear the bars down, but they're rising again, and you're trying to climb up. And while you're doing this, yeah. you're losing data all over the board. So okay. you're walking through a smart city yeah. in which you lose data because you're being filmed by, by a camera. Uh, the GPS of your smartphone is tracked. Oh, right, okay. And maybe your healthcare insurance company saw that you didn't do enough sports because your GPS didn't really move a lot. Yeah. So they might raise your insurance premium and lower you on the social ladder. Right, okay. Probably they also saw that you didn't spend enough time at home with your child, and that's why you're downgraded as well. 
Okay. So you're trying to not lose too much data in your game and yeah. also try to fight for privacy. So very, you know, very in tune with the current sort of concerns that a lot of people have about data collection and, and things like that. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. So what was so what was your inspiration with coming up with with this this game? What made you think of doing this as a game? I got to know a group of refugees yep. in Amsterdam uh, who are in limbo since over 10 years. Wow, okay. So they got, re- um, they got rejected asylum, yeah. but they can't enter the Netherlands, yes. but they also can't travel home to their country. So they're, they're kind of in between laws. They're yeah. not protected by anything. Yeah. And they build a really strong network in our city. Uh, with people who could support them on all kind of rights, so give them law support. Yeah. A doctor helps them with medicine. Oh, wow, okay. So inspired by that, I wanted to uh, raise awareness on the privileges that we have yeah. and how we take them for granted. Okay. And how we should actually, um, yeah, how we have to protect them in order to not lose them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what's the plan? This is uh, going to be on Kickstarter. What sort of time scale do you think you'll be looking after that? Do you know how, how long? Um, so Quality Beast um, launched their first game, uh, Sea Sabine, in yep. January, successfully. Yep. So we want to first uh, manufacture okay, and yep. bring that out to everyone. Yep. And then the second in the line is Towers of the Sun by Stefan Brockman, okay. um, extra abstract 3D strategy game. Yep. And after that, uh, we will launch... Okay. Gives you lots of time to play test and get everything working exactly as you want them. Yes, yeah, and because the theme is very sensitive, yeah, uh, we want to take enough time to really make oh, yeah. to let the theme drain through all of the mechanics. Okay. And yeah. Okay, cool. That's great. Thanks very much for telling us about the game, and wish you all the best. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks. So after Quality Beast, we uh, went round the corner and once again ran into the guys from Blue Donut Studios. Uh, we actually got a chance to have a proper game of line uh, this time. Uh, and I really, we well, we both really enjoyed this. Yeah. It was good fun. Yeah, and we both ended up buying a copy. Yep. It was only, um, it was quite cheap, so. Yeah, was it £12? Uh, yeah, that's right. And it was well worth it, you know. Um, you basically have a like line in the middle, which is like all of the various obstacles that you've got to get over with your skateboard. And then there's like a drafting round where f- uh, a number, one more than the number of players' cards will go out with various skateboarding moves on them. And you've got to try and match up. There's a colour on the top and bottom of the cards which has to match up with the colour on the obstacle. But also there's like red, green and blue lines that go through the cards and you have to, you want to try and make as long a chain of the same colour as you can because they they act as a multiplier so you get more points at the end of the round uh, at the end of the game so yeah really really like that it's it's simple rules but there's there's a lot going on yeah you have to think about it quite a lot yeah and they were also um, play testing the expansion there as well so um we had a chance to chat to Adam and Marcus uh, Adam, the designer, Marcus, uh, who does all the art, but also, I think, runs Blue Down at Studios. So, uh, again, we've got another interview here, so let's listen to that. So I'm here with Adam and Marcus from Blue Down at Studios, and they're showing off Line, the skateboard game. Uh, hi, chaps, thanks for joining us. Oh, quite all right. Uh, Adam, first, you're the designer, so why don't you tell us a bit about uh, what got you into making a game about skateboarding? Uh, so... A few years ago now, I went to a game jam for the release of a skateboarding computer game called Oli Oli. Uh, During it, the requirement was to make a game within 48 hours about skateboarding. And previously, I'd made computer games and stuff at game jams, and I thought, I'm going to mix it up. And I turned up with a bunch of cards and some Sharpies, (laughs) and just went at it, and eventually came up with the the core system behind this. It's been through a bunch of iterations and a bunch of changes and artwork and so on since then, and now we're at the point of getting it printed and out and released and into the world. Cool. So uh, we've had a quick play of it, really like it. Obviously all of the moves are real skateboarding moves. Yep. Um, are you much of a skateboarder yourself? I am not. Okay. I cannot skateboard at all, but I can play Tony Hawk's. So that oh, was the most of the inspiration of that sort of arcade style combos and ludicrous linking of tricks together to make yeah, yeah. a big silly combination of tricks. So why don't you tell us a bit about the mechanics of the game and how it plays. So, uh, so it's based around uh, card laying and connectors. 
So the idea is that each trick is got connectors at the top and bottom for attaching to environment cards. So when you when you go off ramp, you can only do air tricks. Additionally, there are connectors on the side of what kind of tricks you can go into from that. Right. So certain tricks will work well going into other types of tricks. So if you do a a kick flip, you can then land it and go into a manual. Um, those kind of cards sort of thematically linked together and physically linked together with these connectors. The idea is you want to get the same type of connector on a big long string because each one you have next to each other multiplies your score. Yeah. So you end up making a, uh, a these single, just focusing down on a single type of connector and trying to make these big long tricks while competing with the other players in the drafting mechanic to get the cards you need to carry on. Yeah. Cool. So, again, we said it was really fun, but also the cards look great. Marcus, you Thanks. did all the art on the cards. Are you uh, an artist by, by trade or yeah, history? Yeah, or? yeah, no, artist. I started out as an as a artist. I went to art school, and uh, we then I got involved in commercial arts. I was a graphic designer up yeah. in London, uh, and uh, then uh, took a break from that. Uh, ended up in software for quite a few years, and uh, when we set up... Well, one of the reasons why we set up Blue Donut Studios is that we wanted to, to do art and we wanted to do games we, and we wanted to use technology. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's why when we came up with the idea of doing a skateboard game, we thought it was a great opportunity to look at uh, the, the culture of skateboarding uh, and at the same time make it more accessible. Yeah. So the idea is not to, to be too uh, hardcore skateboarding so that... Uh, people can't. It needs to be legible. The yeah. cards need to be easy to read. Uh, we also have to think about uh, colour blindness. Yeah. So uh, uh, we designed the cards in black and white to make sure they, the, the gameplay still works nicely. And obviously, we need to, to make sure uh, it's something that we could take to different countries as well. Yeah. So culturally, it can be uh, acceptable as well. Cool. So, uh, as well as Lion, you, uh, you've been playtesting the expansion this weekend. How's that been going? Uh, pretty well actually uh, we've really nice to get people in and start to take notes and see how it plays with people who haven't just made the game themselves yeah it's the, the intention behind the expansion is to add a bit more randomness and a bit more uh, of the original game is very much one competition this is meant to be messing around in the skate park so it's called the skate park deck and it's got stuff like getting sponsorships being good at certain types of tricks and generally giving you stuff to play around within the very rigid system that's yeah. in there from the beginning cool well if people want to know more where should they go well they should go to uh, bluedonutstudios.com excellent thanks chaps for joining us and uh, all the best for the future thank you thank you very much so the first thing we did on Sunday morning was head over to the Asmodee stand that was right in the back corner of Hall 1 in the hope of getting a game of Athul. However, somebody had already beaten us to it. So we happened to turn round and spot that there was a couple of people who were about to start playing Century Eastern Wonders and needed two more people. It just so happened that it was Aaron and his wife who we knew. So we sat down and invaded their table. Yep. And had a game of Eastern Wonders, which is the latest in the Century Trilogy. This is number two. Uh, you can combine it with Spice Road to make, uh, what, I think it's called Century, Sand and Sea, something like that. Um, but in Eastern Wonders, you have a little cargo boat and you have little warehouses that you can drop on tiles. And the idea is you move around. Each of the tiles has an action that you can do. So you swap, say one high cost spice cube for three slightly lower spice cubes or five of the lowest for one of the highest sort of thing. I believe the spices are all the same as they are in Spice Rose. So you've got yellow cubes, red cubes, green cubes and brown cubes, which is ginger, chilli, tea and cloves. And as you move around, you can drop warehouses on the tiles. If you have a warehouse on a tile, you can do that action, even if your boat is not on that tile. And the idea is you collect spices, little cubes, and you turn in contracts, which are at the ports. There's, there are four ports, um, 
when we were playing. And once you turn in um, your contract at a port, you get the little token for that contract, put it in front of yourself, and the game ends when somebody gets four contracts, uh, which Matt managed to do. I did. I got to three. But I didn't win the game, though. I can't remember who won the game. Was it Aaron? Uh, it might have been Aaron. But there was a bit of uh, consternation over the rules at one point. Is consternation yes. the right word? Probably. Okay. There was a little bit of confusion over the rules. Yeah. Um, Aaron's Aaron's excuse or defence was <laughs> that he'd only been taught it the day before and when he was taught it, the person who taught it to him got it wrong. Yeah. Likely story. Yeah, so we were we. I think we we misused a couple of the tiles, like the extra points tiles. Yeah, um, we did some stuff in the wrong order, and then at which point, by the time we figured it out, we'd all done it, and at which point we just said, "Let's just leave that." Um, and then we, f- I think we figured out later that your you can't drop a warehouse and harvest even though I know both me and Aaron had done that yeah. a couple of times. Um, so we had sort of played it a bit squiffy, house rules. Nevertheless, it was great fun. And uh, sadly, by Sunday, it already sold out because it sold out on Friday. Yeah. Um, so now I believe it's, it's just... Uh, it, I think it's on pre-orders now for general release. Um, I've seen it in a couple of places, but only as a pre-order. Yeah, the Century games have always gone down really well, haven't they? Yeah, they, they, were, they, were, they made them last year as well, the um, Spice Raid one. Um, yeah. 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 And um, this, this one looks really, really good as well. I just, um, I've never actually played either of them, um, so but, uh, well, it's on my list. Yeah, late, later on, on Sunday, I picked up a copy of Century Gollum Edition um, because it was going for cheaper than regular Spice Road. And the Gollum edition is just like a reuse of the theme. Mm. Sorry, a re-theme of Spice Road, which they reckon you can't put in with Eastern Wonders, but I'm sure you could force it to work. <laughs> if, it, if it's just a re-theme, then it's, all the mechanics are the same. I'm sure you can, you know, push the two together somehow. Never ever underestimate the, the power of brute force and ignorance. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Eastern Wonders is one of the the takeaway wow factor ones. I think it did really well. Yeah. So we then wandered uh, back into Hall Two, and I wanted to take a look at Penguin Brawl: Heroes of Pentarctica. <laughs> um, we got handed a flyer for this at one point, and uh, I was looking for all the stuff I'd been given on Saturday night, and I thought, oh, I might, I wouldn't mind having having a quick look at this. Uh, unfortunately, the guys there didn't have any copies of the game to sell because they had a bit of a customs snafu. But uh, we did have a chance to have a chat with them. So they are Team Custard Kraken, the people who make this game, which I thought was quite a funny name. <laughs> what a brilliant name! Yeah, <laughs> they said they were very proud of it. Um, but we had a chance to chat with Charlie from Team Custard Kraken about Penguin Ball. So, yeah, let's uh, listen to that interview now. So I'm here at the Penguin Ball stand with Charlie from Team Custard Kraken. Great Hello name. there. <laughs> yeah, we're very fond of it. Yeah. And, uh, well, I've come here to find out a bit more about Penguin Ball, so why don't you tell us all about it? Okay, so Penguin Brawl is a uh, combat-based card game for two to eight players, uh, suitable for ages 10 plus. Uh, we, we reckon on average it takes about half an hour to 45 minutes. It does get longer the more players you have in the game. Um, but the, the basic mechanics, combat, they work a bit like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Simplified combat, simple, it does this much damage, it takes this much damage. Beyond that, uh, it does play head-to-head very well, uh, but in a three or more player game, so that you're not bored when you lose all your points and watching everyone else <laughs> play, uh, you can stay playing in the game, you just can't win anymore. Right. So um, at that point, uh, you have nothing left to lose, and if anyone has made an enemy of you, <laughs> you can make their life hell. Yeah. Uh, what we find then is that the person who wins tends to deserve to win. Yeah. Uh, they played well, and they played nicely. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, uh, there is a strategic element to the game. Most of the cards have a secondary effect that, come, that comes into play depending on which penguins are on the board. 
Uh, sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to have them. Otherwise, uh, it, some of them it can be anywhere. Yeah. And uh, all of that is clearly written on the on the cards. Usually, it just sort of doubles. So you know, where it says draw one card, you draw two. Uh, but some there are exceptions to that. Uh, it's all it's all on the cards yeah. really. Uh, there are several different types of cards as well. Uh, there are cards that give you extra abilities as a player yourself. Uh, weapons and armor to boost the stats of your penguins. Uh, curses, which uh, affect everyone usually. There are some exceptions to that, but they are always negative and okay. can completely change the balance of power. Yep. Uh, there are spells and instants. Uh, spells you can only use on your own turn, and each one has its own unique effect. Uh, and uh, instants you can use during anyone else's turn as well. So they, they can throw a spanner in the works sometimes. Yep. Uh, but yes, every single card is unique. Uh, 120 cards in the base game. And currently, two small expansions of 30 cards each available. Okay. So. And uh, yes, yeah, so you're going to be selling this uh, online in the future? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we unfortunately uh, got stuck by customs and uh, did not get our stock for this con. But uh, we are getting it through tomorrow, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be starting to sell things soon. Uh, most of our stock is still on its way from China. Yeah. But um, yeah, we will be putting it online as soon as possible, probably late June, early to mid July. It does depend on how long it takes the boat to get here. Yeah. But um, as soon as it is with us, it will be going on as many platforms as we can. We can put it on Amazon, yeah. eBay, our own sh uh, website, yeah. anything that will let us put it on there, we will be selling it. Uh, the base game we're going to be selling at the moment. We're, we're, this may change. It's obviously yeah. subject to what uh, costs are involved. But fifteen pounds for the base game, seven fifty for each of the expansions. Okay. So that's pretty good. So if people want to find out more, uh, social media and website address. Absolutely, uh, penguinbrawl.com yep. uh, is is probably the main one. Uh, we are, um, but yes, uh, we are also on Facebook. Uh, various other things. Uh, we. We do have a couple of videos on YouTube at the moment. There's not a lot on there. I mean, yeah. it's social media, we're there. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we've got all points covered. Some of them are a lot more active than others, obviously. Yeah. So there's only so much time in the day for two people. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks very much, and I wish you all the best of luck. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of the con. Thank you very much. Nice speaking to you. Have a Next up, we ended up chatting to Paul Harris, who's the guy behind HandyCon, which is the convention that we've mentioned uh, on this show before which happens a couple of times a year and also scrumpy which is a game uh, i like the look of last year as well which he's still developing and uh, he was happy to talk to us again and do a quick interview so let's have a listen to that so we're standing here at ukg with paul from invincible games hello and uh, you're here with scrumpy and you're here to promote handycon yep so um, let's start with Handicon, I guess. That's okay. been going for a while now. Two it? years. So two years ago, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't even an idea. And I was sat gaming here in, yep. the, in the Hilton. And I had one day where I didn't even attend the, the trade fair. I just played games yeah. the whole time in the, in the Hilton. I went, I wonder if I could replicate this part of the convention without the traders, without the trade fair. Yeah. So I found a hotel and I networked and spoke to people. And so, to my great surprise, uh, six, seven months later in January... We had 225 people turn up and wow. play games for three days okay. in the hotel. And um, so I thought I, I was going to do it once a year. And people were saying, well, you, when's the next one? When's the next one? So I spoke to the hotel and we managed to do another one in August. Wow. And that had 275 people. And so we did another one in January that had 330 people. The hotel was at bursting point. So yeah. we've now moved eight miles down the road to the Maidenhead Holiday Inn. And we're expecting 500 people. And it's basically a festival of gaming. Yeah. It's I call it, the, it's the biggest open gaming um, convention in the, in the UK because we don't have trade stands and things like that. We have the odd unpublished games, yeah. so people have a chance to play, play games that aren't out yet. We have a playtest zone, we have a, a design competition for designers, but what we don't do is have loads and loads of traders trying to get sell, sell their wares. It's about bringing your games, we've got a huge games library to borrow games, yeah, yeah. and it's about oh, pla the people playing games in, in advance, but it, we try and be as inclusive as we can. We want people... Um, to come and meet people and people to feel, feel comfortable coming on their own. Yeah. We try and actively help people who are anxious or things like that. So being a teacher, I'm very outgoing and gregarious. <laughs> so I'm, I'm willing to go up and say, look, if you're anxious, come and see me because I'm quite friendly and things. Yeah. Um, and then I'll do the introductions to people. You don't need to sort of go out and cross that threshold of meeting new people. I'll do that for you. I'll get you into a game. I'll run the game. You don't even have to speak to people for the first bits. Yeah. And then 
we found people who I've come back and back and back and said, well, I, I'm seeing people now who are my friends through Handicon that yeah. I didn't, didn't even know. They come from the other side of the country. So yeah. that's what Handicon's all about. Cool. So the next one's in August the 10th to 12th. Yep. Yeah. And uh, January the 20th to 22nd in 2019. Cool. I've got to ask about the name then. Where did the, how did you come up with Handicon so as a name? I, I, love, I love the fact that Basically, it, it, the first one was at the Handycross Roundabout, right. uh, which is just outside ha High Wycombe. It's a, a roundabout called the Handycross Roundabout. Yeah. So we went, I went with Handycon because it, it was snappy and it, and it worked. We're now no longer at the Handycross Roundabout, but I'm not changing my name no, ever. No. So just like some of the other conventions that are out there, um, which started in one place and then have moved, we're now still going to be the Handycon, Handycon because it's, it's handy for me because I live in Maidenhead now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it's very convenient. So you're also here with Scumpy, the deck building game about cider. Yep. So people who listen to our podcast know we back a lot of games on Kickstarter, so that's good because this is going to be on Kickstarter. Yep. I have a thing about games that involve food and drink, so yep. that's also that. And the only alcohol I drink is cider. Okay. So for me, this is the ideal game. So why don't you tell, tell us all a little bit, bit about that? So as a little thing, I will mention first, first of all, I no, no longer drink, but if I do, it's always cider. Yep. I used to drink way more than I do now. <laughs> but... Um, I, I came up with this idea for a game and I wanted to uh, turn it, uh, a game where you can turn cider, uh, apples into cider, uh, wood into barrels and make barrels, uh, fill barrels with cider and sell it. Yeah. And I, so I came up with this idea of a, a deck manipulation game. So it started out as a deck builder, but I didn't want, I realised quite early on that I didn't want the same, in a deck builder you're kind of accumulating cards pretty much every round. Yeah, yeah. In my game, you accumulate maybe two or three more workers during the whole game. It's more about um, managing where the workers are, because your 15 workers that everyone starts with yeah. are manipulated because on the back of the cards are the resources of apples, wood, barrels, and cider. So your workers will also be flipped over and go into your storehouse and serve as those um, resources as well. Yeah. So one, one thing I was try keen to do is it's more about managing which cards you use, when you use them, and manipulating them. Yeah. The second thing that makes it very much very different is I, I used to get very frustrated with, with games like Dominion. I love Dominion, but if I just I, I'd set up a lovely lovely deck and then I just felt bad bad card hand, yeah. couldn't do what I wanted to do, yeah, yeah. and the person next to me gets the perfect hand and is able to do everything. Yeah. So what I, did, what I decided to do is we have a list, a list of um, different um, actions that you can perform yourself. They are always slightly less efficient than the workers who are, uh, are specialists in that area. Yeah. But it means that I can reject, I can just use two of the cards of my five in my hand. Right. And instead, choose one of the actions so I can timely, you sacrifice efficiency, but you gain being able to do things at the right time for you to be able to always be able to do something to progress you forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a 45 minute game. And one of the final things that makes it different is some of the cards have a, a keeping out symbol, which means the cards can stay from round to round. The benefit being, you know you're going to have that card in your hand next round. Yeah. The, 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 the negative being, you're going through your deck slower, so any upgraded cards that you've purchased using your recruiter come round less frequently. Right. So you're, it's a trade-off there. And so um, I've got uh, several things about it that I think are, are different. My artist is a, a daughter of a friend of mine. She's 14 years old, still wow, at school. Okay. And, and as you'll be able to testify to, to your listeners, yep. it's, uh, some of the art is, is, is fantastic. I am massively passionate about inclusivity, and so one of my biggest things, because I've got 15 different um, characters, I want 15 different genders, minor uh, yeah, minorities, yeah. I want a character in a wheelchair, I want to have re represented, representative of everyone who might play the game, yeah. is represented among the characters, and I also want to subvert stereotypes. So I actively insisted I wanted my woodcutter to be female, I, wanted, I, I, I wanted, didn't want her to be a female who had... Uh, lewdly dressed or inappropriately dressed if, that, if, that, if, yep. if that's a more appropriate phrase I understand phrase. what you mean and so that's a passion for me so which, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm kickstarting it myself yeah. I'm not going to be a, a publisher of many many games I'm going to be a designer who designs for other people yeah. but what I'm really passionate about here is I wanted to do something a bit different so when, I'm, when my kickstarter campaign is going to be slightly different and by that what I mean is um, my artist my artist being 14 years old one of the stretch goals, or some of the stretch goals, are going to be related to her getting a higher percentage and right, things like okay, that. Yeah. So, which some people have come to me and said, "What?" But we want all stretch goals to be more stuff for us. And some people have said to me, oh, "That's amazing. I, I love the idea yeah, of a, well, an emotional stretch idea. goal rather than a, just a oh, different card backs and things." Yeah. So I'm going to try and do different things with it and make it what what to me what Kickstarter used to be about funding a project that's a passion project of yeah. someone. 
rather than just a, a sales platform. So yeah. This is what I'm doing. I have now talked at you for about <laughs> 10 minutes. I do apologise. Seven minutes. So okay. you're all right. So don't worry. So um, if people want to find out more about you, about Handicon, the game, where can they go? Okay, so Handicon has got a website, www.handicon.co.uk. I am Paul Fronsdorf Harris. I'm quite active on, on Facebook and BGG. Um, if you want to find more, I'm Bonobo Gamer on BGG. You can find my blog, which I publish every Monday, which is um, where I discuss a new mechanic I've come up with for a game. So I'll review what so, so the last one I did, just did. I was looking at weather and I was discussing uh, three games that do, I think do weather very well and an innovative mechanic on how you could do weather in a game. So rather than discussing a whole game idea, I discuss a specific mechanic you could use in a game. Yeah. Um, I'm on BGG there, like I say. Scrumpy is also on BGG, so you could go on there and find Scrumpy, find out more information, and it's also on Facebook. So if you type Scrum Scrumpy game, you can find out more information, see some cool. of our artwork, and follow, follow the, 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 the project. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for talking to us, mate. Really appreciate it. And best of luck for the future. Thank you very much. So after we'd had a chat with Paul, we were just wandering, and we got uh, accosted by a, a necromancer of some description. Yes, at offering for us to spin the wheel of doom. Yeah, and I won a free sticker. Yay. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> then the necromancer told us about his game, which he was showing, which was Roll Quest. Which, um, actually, if he hadn't have stopped us, I probably wouldn't have looked at, but I'm glad we did, because actually I really like the look of it. Um, it's a light role-playing card game, social game, and we all, everyone gets roles to play, you know, uh, from the cards in the game. But everyone also gets hidden personalities that they have to um, perform. But also, you can play curses on the other players to make the game more difficult for them. So, like, for example, you've got your personality, and then I can play a card on you that says you've got to speak in a certain accent, or you've got a rhyme. Or something like that, you know. So it's, yeah. it's a fun, like, social party game. And it's good good improv stuff because, you know, I like Whose Line Is It Anyway and all that kind of thing. And it reminds me a lot of a lot of that. So um, this game's by Hercules Game Studios. And the chat we spoke to was uh, Phoebus. Again, he was happy to be recorded. So here's a quick chat with him. Okay, so we're here at uh, Hercules Game Studios where we're going to have a look at RollQuest. So why don't you tell us all about it? Yeah, so uh, RollQuest is a light social role-playing card game. And I know that's a lot of adjectives, so let me try <laughs> yeah, and explain yeah. it. Um, RollQuest uh, is for three to six players, and we're working on an eight-player expansion right now as okay. well. Uh, it's, uh, it lasts about 25 minutes. Yeah. And the way it works is each character gets, each player gets one character, and you have a, a mix of fantasy characters. So you yeah. have, you know, the wizard, the necromancer, but you also might get a kind of more everyday character like the innkeeper or the blacksmith. Yep. Yeah. Um, the characters move around the city, which is represented by these um, little cards, yeah. the tavern, the town hall. And when they, when two characters meet together, they have to have a role play interaction. Yeah. So you have a sun timer, and for one minute you have to act in character and speak to the other right, person. Right, okay. Um, a third player usually sets up the scene by setting a scenario. So you know, yep. the, the blacksmith goes to the tavern and hasn't, you know, has been going every day and not paying for the beer. Yeah, yeah. And the innkeeper is not happy about that, something like that. Yeah. Um, now, both characters have a hidden personality that they get from these personality cards. Yeah. And they need to role play the personality. Right. In the end of the one minute, the players try to guess each other's personality and then if they don't guess it right the other players get a chance as well right, okay. every time you guess someone's personality or someone guesses yours you get some uh, goblin heads which yeah. is the cryptocurrency of the future I like to call it <laughs> um, so the and in the end of the game, whoever has the most goblin heads wins. Okay, cool. And to make it more interesting, we have a number of curses that you can put on the other players. Yeah. Uh, there's the curse of uh, Julius Caesar, where they have to speak about themselves in third person. Okay. There's the curse of the linguist, where you have to avoid a specific word. The curse of the flamingo, where you have to stand on one leg during the interaction. <laughs> So there's, uh, there's quite a bit of silliness going on. I quite like this one, The Curse of Babylon, where you, the target player has to speak with an accent of your choice. Yeah, so. I know. This has been uh, <laughs> quite a tricky one. I think my, my, the most difficult one is The Curse of Rhyming. 
Oh, uh, oh yeah, I've been watching It was pretty, pretty hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's pretty much World Quest. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's the game is finished. We've done more than eighty playtesting sessions, so yeah. the rules are almost final. Um, we we're going to go live on Kickstarter in the beginning of July. Yep. So if people want to find out more, obviously they can keep an eye out on Kickstarter. But uh, is there a website, social media that they yeah, can go so to? Yeah. So our 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 website is uh, after dash London dot com, yep. which is our first game that we created, and then slash RollQuest. Or if you go to after after dash London dot com, uh, there will be a link for Kick, uh, for RollQuest as yeah. well. Okay. And we're Hercules Game Studios. We're on Twitter, Facebook. That's cool. Snapchat, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, mate. It's been uh, great. And, uh, yeah, really look forward to seeing how it goes for you. Best of luck for the future. Cool, thank you. Before we move on from Hercules, um, the guys showed us um, what they got from the Starbucks as well. Because, uh, you know, normally they write the names on the on the cups. They'd actually written Wizard and Necromancer on them because of the <laughs> outfits they were wearing. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was quite funny. So... Moving on from them, we then went and had a look at another game I'd um, seen on a flyer, which was Witless Wizards from Draw Lab Entertainment, which was just basically a light um, battle game with with cards where your wizards casting spells on on each other. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was not really that nothing really heavy to it, um, but you have a weapon, an armor, and a sort of magical charm. And you draw cards from the deck, and if you want to, you can use one of them on you, or you can use them on the other players to make them weaker. And then everyone starts off at 20 health, and you just attack each other until you're the last one standing. Yeah, okay, it's like a Wizards Battle Royale. Yeah. Basically. Mm. Cool. That's coming to Kickstarter this month, I believe, so uh, if that sounds like it might be up your street, just keep an eye open for that. So next, as we were wandering around... Um, we were grabbed and taken for a quick demo of a game called Footprint, which is on Kickstarter now, and they've already hit their uh, primary funding goal. And Footprint is a little game about trying to depollutionize the world. And thankfully, Owen agreed to have a chat with Matt, so he can explain this a little bit better than I can. So let's have a quick listen to that. So we're here with Owen, who's going to tell us all about Footprint, the sustainability game. Okay, Thanks so for joining us, mate. Thank you. Um, so Footprint is a game which I've designed. Um, it's been under development for several years. Uh, it's now on Kickstarter. Um, the aim of the game is to get pollution off Earth. Um, so the player that gets the most pollution off is the winner. Um, but also every go we turn over a Footprint card, if we run out of Footprint cards, we've got all the pollution off then everyone loses as well so it's a semi-cooperative game where you're playing against the clock also looking to be the uh, best person as well yeah. get the most pollution off um, on your turn as well you also answer bonus question um, which will help you in the game if you get it right we've got three levels of cards we've got beginner that's aimed at children medium adults and advanced those eco warriors that are out there. yeah yeah okay. <laughs> Oh, we played with medium yesterday and I was terrible, so... Uh, <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Well, it's a one in three chance of getting it right. So even if you don't know, then you can guess. And, of course, you can maybe learn a few things as well. Yeah. No, it's on all of the... Uh, so every player gets credit uh, cards as well, which they use to, you know, perform actions or whatever. A lot of them have got uh, famous people in the uh, the green space uh, on them as well. That's right, yeah. So I spent a long time um, looking at different environmentalists around the world. Um, obviously, there's some that people know well, like David Attenborough. Yeah. Um, but there's other ones as well um, from other parts of the world um, which people maybe don't know about and I thought it would be a great platform to just yeah. raise awareness about that. So, I mean, I'm guessing raising awareness is your main aim with this, this game. That's it, yeah. It's an educational game, so um, I think there's some really interesting and also kind of worrying things about environmental issues out there. Yeah. Um, so I thought a game would be a really good way to uh, raise awareness but also make it fun and engaging for people um, and... Um, I've got an idea of taking this to kind of schools as well, yeah. and also families as well. So, kind of education is a really big part of it. It's interesting because this isn't the only, it's the only game about pollution here, obviously. But there's, a, there's also a couple of other games I've seen that have to do with data privacy and stuff like that. Yeah. So it seems that like a lot of the things that are going on, people are taking inspiration from those to, to make games about them. So. I guess it's a really creative market. I've seen games on everything. Yeah, true. Uh, I saw the privacy one. I thought that was really clever as well. Yeah. So it's great to see 
and games branching out and doing other areas as well. Okay. Uh, so the game's on Kickstarter now. How long is it the campaign live for? Um, it's for the whole month, so it's up to the end of June. Yep. Um, so we're down as Footprint World Edition uh, yep. on Kickstarter. So I'm pleased to say we've already hit our target. Good. So it's going to happen. So um, you know, if anyone wants to go on and pledge, then you will get a copy. That's great. Well, I wish you all the best and thanks for joining us. Thanks for signing. So after we spoke to Owen on the Footprint stand, one of his volunteers recommended that we pop a couple of stands down to go and speak with a young lady called Lily, who was only 12 years old and had designed the game that she and her family were there to demo and show to the expo. So, yeah, we popped down to Double L Games and Matt had a chat with Lily. Let's have a quick listen to that now. So we're sitting here at Double L Games with uh, Lily, the designer of Build. Hi, Lily, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. So before we start, everyone should know this is your game and you're 12 years old, yes. correct? Okay. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what Build is all about? Um, Build is about deals, diplomacy and international development. Um, and so you start off with a um, country that's been... Um, ruined and devastated by the last government right. and um, you slowly build up your country so it's thriving and prosperous and um, but you can be um, set back by the events things like natural disasters and terrorist attacks yeah. Um, so yeah that's sort of the gist of the game okay cool how long has it taken you to get the game to the point you are at now then about a year a year okay yeah. that's not too bad and what, dis- what made you decide I'm going to design a game? It was actually geography homework. Okay. Um, and so I played it with my dad and he was like, this is really good, you should do something about it. Yeah. And then, so then we got um, some backers yeah. um, who work in international development in Africa. Right. And they were like, this is really good, we, we want to back it. Um, and then... They've bought 100 copies of the game that isn't even finished yet. <laughs> okay. And that was when it was, like, still, like, bits of paper. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, been really lucky. Okay, so that's cool. What's the plan to do? Are you going to take it to Kickstarter? or are you yeah. Gonna, yeah. So we're going to take it to Kickstarter and hope that, you know, it gets lots of attention and funding. Yeah. So um, is your family board gamers generally then? So, yeah, okay, yeah, so that's yeah. fine. Okay. That's cool. Because that would have been weird if uh, you had just done that. And... No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why it wasn't, the game wasn't like, um, a lot of people were making snakes and ladders type games. Yeah, yeah. And so it got, um, you know, it was not snakes and ladders. And it yeah, was something yeah, exactly. a, a bit more. <laughs> a bit more Because <laughs> I've been playing these sorts of games. That's cool. So, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Well, uh, if people want to find out more, where can they go? What, uh, do you have a website address? Or... Yes, so you, can, um, so you can go to our website at www doublelgames.co.uk yep. or follow us on social media at Double R Games. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I wish you all the best of luck and uh, Thank you. hope it goes great for you Thank and you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. So thanks very much to Lily for having a chat with us and after that we were sort of wandering and I happened to wander past the stand for Immortality uh, which was a game that I had put on my maybe list And I thought, well, you know, we're here, why not? Uh, So we had a chat with Nicky, who is the designer of Immortality. Um, And he sort of, well, he explained the basics of the game. So the idea is that Zeus is a bit bored and he wants to have a competition. So he's created a labyrinth and you as mortals, if you can defeat the labyrinth and Zeus himself, then he will give you the gift of immortality we didn't manage to stop for a game um, um, we were quite busy trying to get our last few uh, interviews in so although we didn't get a chance to sit down and demo immortality Nicky is a local games designer so we'll hopefully be catching up with him a little bit later on and he's also going to be at the board games bash in Birmingham later on this month so then shortly after that, we had a text message saying, I'm on my way back from <laughs> Gareth, or words to that effect. Um, and then a quick, a quick message saying, 
Haha, I've got a demo at Solomon Kane. There's space, come and play. So we, we shot over from Hall 2 back to Hall 1, diverting briefly to buy Matt an expansion box to Linky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, got there and there were still seats. Uh, so we had a, a demo of Solomon Kane. Yeah, which um, involves miniatures. It does indeed. I actually got Raid to finally play a miniatures based game, which is quite good. Um, yeah, I was I, I was eyeing up Solomon Kane based on Raid's back recommendations on Friday and um, couldn't get near it. I walked past it on Friday morning about 10 o'clock and uh, the Mythic guy said, oh, look, do you want a game? I said, yes. And then my friends walked off and uh, I thought, oh, ah, I'll come back later. And of course, came back later and couldn't get near it. And uh, I did see a friend of mine playing it on Friday afternoon. He declared it was awesome. So I was quite keen to give it a go. So yeah, I managed to come back on Sunday afternoon thanks to the um, my uh, my lovely mother-in-law looking after my son for a couple of hours so I could I could disappear back up to the expo. And um, yeah, it was it, something okay. It was... Um, I've, I've thought about it quite a lot over the last couple of days. Um, I, I liked I liked the mechanics. I, th- I thought it was decent. I'm not sure if it's a game that I want to buy yet. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, I quite I, I liked the idea that you didn't directly control Solomon as such. I like the fact that you all played the fates that surround him. So yeah, if, you, if you're not aware of the game, it's a game where obviously you play Demon Hunter Extraordinaire, Solomon Kane as he wanders around and basically fights evil and investigates creepy goings on and saves people. Um, but you don't really play him. You play the fates that surround him and try to guide him and protect him from all the nastiness that happens around him on the board. Um, I, I, I thought... The, I think it, it probably suffered a bit because of the expo, in, in all fairness. I think if you were sitting around your house with a glass of wine and um, some creepy music playing, I think it would work really well. Um, and I, I did enjoy the game we played. I'm not sure how you, how you guys found, what, what you guys thought, how you found I, it. No, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. It's it's, it's very unique. I never, don't think I've ever played anything quite like it. Mm, yeah, yeah I, 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 I quite enjoyed it. I like the fact that you didn't you weren't playing against each other. So you had to sit there and think about who was best to play first, second, mm. third, fourth, based on who had what actions and how likely it was you were going to be able to achieve those actions. Um, so I, I think I like that because it's a co-op. Um, and I do like the ability to just sort of sit and have a chat about what's going on sometimes mm. as opposed to everybody sort of sitting in silence, thinking about their own moves and their own hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did like that. Um, it's also one of those games I felt that you, normally those kind of games, um, everyone's out there for themselves. You know, everyone's kind of like at moment for looking for their own little heroic moment. You, you, you chuck a bunch of minutes in the game on a game board, and it's a dungeon crawler, and everyone's trying to be the hero and doing their alpha male bit. Um, this game doesn't really support that at all. You, you, know, you, you won't last two seconds if you try that. I thought that was quite nice. Um, but yeah, I thought the, the, the cooperative element was done really well. It, it is unlike uh, um, I haven't played a system like that before, which is quite interesting. Um, the only thing I would say is I thought the Kickstarter price they were quoting was a little bit wow. I'd be interested to see what's in the Kickstarter for that much money. Yeah, it was uh, it was a bit on the on the high end, which is generally what puts me off mini games to begin with. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unfortunately uh, it's it's a natural side product, byproduct of being a miniature based game. You normally get slightly elevated costs. Um, that one's um, yeah, hundred I think it's hundred and hundred and twenty dollars for the base pledge. It's quite a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I liked it. I'm glad it's coming to retails, and it gives me more time to think about whether or not I want to pick it up later on. Um, I probably won't do the Kickstarter because I don't think I can afford it too much, to be honest, at the moment. But uh, yeah, no, I quite liked it. It was good. Cool. Awesome. You also on Sunday got a chance to play a demo of Lifeform from Hall or Nothing. Yeah, um, and actually, this is the game I literally came back to the expo to play. Um, I was wandering around on Friday. I may have actually backed this on Kickstarter. Backed it a few months back. Um, I was I, the idea of the game is for those that don't know about it. It's uh, there's there's two alien based games that are out this year. There's Nemesis and there's Lifeform. Um, Nemesis it would ordinarily ordinarily be the kind of game I'd be naturally attracted to because of the sheer amount of miniatures that are in it, um, which look absolutely brilliant. And I did back it briefly and then sort of withdrew myself. Um, Lifeform is a similar kind of game. You basically it's you playing a very version of Alien um, you are survivors on a ship and one player plays the alien and the alien is basically hunting you down um, so your aim is to get as, as the crew is to wander around the ship get the items that you need onto the rescue craft and get off the ship
ship in one piece, preferably before the alien eats you in the face. Um, it's yeah, it was good. I, I got a chance to sit down with Mark Chaplin, the guy who created it, and give have a quick go. It was only a quick a quick go, um, but it it was great. It was re- you know the, the the mechanics are really sound. It's 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 all done by, by um, deck building elements and card based elements. Um, it's, it's put some really nice mechanics in there so that even if you you die, there's there's no actual player elimination. You can come back as the ship's cat, which is interesting. Or you can come back as the mainframe, which controls the ship. Um, so you, even when you die, you're not ever you're never really out of the game, which is nice. Um, and the alien itself is a really interesting creature to fight against because just like in the film, alien it's completely invulnerable. You can never kill it. It's constantly hunting you. It's constantly chasing around the ship. Um, but it's it's done in such a way that you can you can escape. It's fair. Um, but yeah, that's really good. I only got a very brief demo, but it was really good. And it, 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 it's one I'm really happy I backed on kickstarter so while you were doing that gareth me and matt went off for a, a quick last minute shop as obviously that was the last hour of the show Boo. um so was there anything else that you spotted joe over the weekend uh, that you liked the gareth uh, yeah there was two other games um one was um inspiring uh, sorry uh, legends untold which was finally finally there in its complete format and looking really nice i don't know if anybody else has seen that one um i've had it on my back list for over a year now and um it was nice to chat to the, the creator and see the finished product and it's looking amazing to be honest with you um it's it's taken a while to get to the stage to be honest it has um but the the work is evident it's clearly a passion project for them and um yeah i was re- it, it's it's nice to see it coming together and it's not going to be much longer now which is even better um long time which... listeners of the offline gaming podcast will of course recall that we interviewed kevin a couple of years ago after first meeting him at ukge 2016 and what a lovely fellow he is, <laughs> he, is even ga- he even gave me a piece of his own shortbread that's how nice he was he walked up and said have some shortbread it's it's practically good food it's practically health it's 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 scottish it's got to be good food i think he yeah, said yeah. It at the time um which is really nice to me. and it was it was great i'm just really sad that i didn't get a chance to sit and play it on friday because i was running around um and then by the time i got back on, on sunday it was just i didn't have enough time which is a shame but um nice to meet him properly i'm really happy about it uh which is really really cool um the other game which I got a very brief look at and I had a chance to play with the author of the game and I didn't and I'm really annoyed at myself for not doing it was Escape Tales The Awakening um, yeah I saw that. that I thought that looked quite interesting as a yeah. concept yeah it's it, it's it is yeah, it looks awesome um, it's an escape room based game with horror elements which is right on my street um, I didn't get to that's what, that's kind of all I know about it I, the artwork looks really stunning and it's a, it's basically it's unlike most escape based games where it's timed this is a story driven one so you can you can, you can sort of take, play at your own pace which is really quite nice there's quite a lot of that stuff coming out now with like the Seventh Continent and like Escape the Dark Castle sort of create your own adventure games which, which are obviously always in fashion which is nice but I really quite like the idea of it and um, the storyline seems quite interesting and yeah that's one I would if I could go back in time for Friday and play it I would <laughs> but unfortunately I didn't get time so but that was that was the other one I was really excited by to see awesome mm-hmm. I also bought some games that I was looking for for ages like Sword and Sorcery which I've been dying to get for ages <laughs> Yeah, I think you spent more than we did, but uh... a little bit more. I also picked up Role Player, which I've been dying to get for about a year now, and that was that, that's great fun. I've really enjoyed that. Awesome. Okay, so that's our UKGE roundup episode all done. Um, thanks for joining us, Gareth. It's been a pleasure to have you again. Thank you very much for inviting me on again. Much appreciated. We'll talk more about the games that we purchased at the expo in our next episode, where hopefully we'll have had a chance to play some of them. Uh, But for now, it's our usual outro, so everyone knows how to find us on social media. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Togcast. We're also available on Facebook if you just search for The Offline Gamer, or alternatively, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Togcast. You can listen to our podcast at soundcloud.com slash offline gamer, or you can find it on iTunes and most other good podcast platforms by just searching for The Offline Gamer. If you'd like to drop us an email, ask us a question, send us a request, you can at offlinegamerpodcast at gmail.com. Or there is a contact form on our website, which which is is www.offlinegamer.co.uk, where you can find all that we've just mentioned and also our videos and everything else that we ever do all goes on there. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time for episode 31. That's been The Offline Gamer. Bye. Bye. Bye.